Good evening. I want to thank you to our June 8th, uh, 2022 uh, Shrewsbury School Committee meeting. Thank you for many of you for, for being here and for those watching online. I'd like to, as always, thank uh, Shrewsbury Media Connection for their ongoing support and both live broadcast and ability to find these matters online after our meeting. Um, we have a full agenda tonight. So our first item up is public participation. And I'd like to welcome, we have had a request to speak, uh, initially brought forward by Mr. Gary Chalmers, the president of SEA. But I understand we have two individuals with us this evening, both uh, Noreen Christie of the um, Shrewsbury Paraprofessional Association, along with Paula Todi from the Shrewsbury Educational Foundation. And I'd welcome you to come on up to the microphone. Um, I'll just remind you that if you can introduce yourselves and say your affiliation, and then you have um, three minutes to, to address the committee. Sure. Thank well, you. thank you, everyone. I'm Paula Todi, and I'm the vice um, president at the high school. I'm here to represent um, the Shrewsbury Education Association. And um, this is... I'm Noreen Christie, here to represent the Shrewsbury Paraprofessional Association. And together, we're here to talk to you tonight about the Fair Share Amendment. So. The fair share amendment on the November ballot would create an additional tax of 4% on annual personal uh, income above $1 million. The new revenue over $1 billion a year is required to be spent on quality public education and affordable public colleges and universities and for the repair and maintenance of roads, bridges, and public transportation. Only people who earn more than $1 million annually will be impacted, the top 1% of Massachusetts households. They can clearly afford to pay a little more, just four cents a dollar, on the portion of their annual income above $1 million. 99% of us won't pay a penny more, and we'll all benefit from better schools, roads, bridges, and public transportation. This November, <clears throat> people from all walks of life are coming together to create better schools and transportation. With the Fair Share Amendment, we can make the Massachusetts tax system fairer and make the big investments we've been putting off new public school buildings with great educators, safer roads and bridges, affordable public college, accessible to vocational education and job training programs, fast and reliable public transportation, and pre-K pre classrooms for every child. I know that sounds like a lot, but to give you a couple of talking points, public schools throughout our state are struggling to recover from the effects of the COVID pandemic. Now more than ever, students need smaller classes, social and emotional support, extra tutoring, and additional counselors, nurses, and social workers to help them get back on track. Many of our school buildings are more than 50 years old and need substantial repairs and upgrades to windows, bathrooms, heating and cooling systems, technology, internet capability, and other critical infrastructure. All students need a well-rounded education, and that includes science, technology, engineering, math, the STEM program, music, art, athletics, but many schools have been forced to cut these essential programs due to budget shortfalls. Far too many families can't access, access high-speed preschool programs that support working parents and provide students with a strong start to their education. The Fair Share Amendment would provide badly needed long-term funding to get our pre-K 12 public schools back on track and give educators and students the resources they need moving forward. The success of our entire economy depends on addressing these issues and remaining a leader in public education. The Fair Share Amendment will allow us to do that. And I know Shrewsbury has been very well uh, represented and very well blessed with good schools because, because of the school committee and because of Dr. Sawyer and because of the teachers our professionals, but we have a lot of schools too that need, they really need badly, and Shrewsbury could take a little bit of that too. So we're, at, we're urging you to sign this, this amendment and, um, and put our name on it and make it, make it come true for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would also just remind members of the public that we welcome public participation at any of our meetings uh, going forward. Should anyone wish to address the committee, they can do so by reaching out to the chair in advance of the meeting. And thank you for being here with us tonight, both um, Ms. Todi and Ms. Christie. Um, now we're gonna move on to the next item on our agenda, and that is chairperson or members' reports. Do we have anything from any of our members this evening? Yeah. I do need to just take a moment and uh, Congratulate our graduates. I had the unfortunate um, 
impact of COVID in my family during graduation events last week, so I could not attend graduation, so I wanted to say my congrats to the graduates, even though they're hopefully no longer watching school committee meetings, but I do need to also thank my Vice Chair, Mr. Palich, who had the two-day heads-up notice of you're on deck to distribute uh, diplomas and address the class, and I thank you very much for, for, for ably stepping in, uh, though I missed probably maybe one of the best moments of being chair, so that is uh, disappointing for me. Um, and also, I, I do want to also let, let folks know that Dr. Sawyer, uh, Mr. Collins, and myself met recently this uh, earlier this week with Representative Hannah Kane and State Senator Michael Moore to talk about the impacts of the new admission policy at Assabet Valley and the impacts that was having per state regulation on our district. Um, currently, all of our students who have applied have been put, um, our eighth grade students have been put on the wait list, and we know this is an important issue for our students in, in particular. Um, and we're going to need to develop local, regional, and maybe state level responses, and that meeting was really to talk about what, what, what could be done at the state level, and I really want to thank them both for their, their support of our district and, and having those conversations with us as we try to riddle our way out of this pretty complicated problem, so uh, thank you to both of them. With that then, uh, Dr. Sawyer, I'm going to turn it over to the next item on our agenda, and that is superintendent's report. Thank you, Ms. Heffernan. Uh, I wanted to also congratulate the class of 2022 of Shrewsbury High School on their successful graduation last week. Uh, our seniors, uh, we we're back to a uh, more typical schedule of events to celebrate them uh, and honor them uh, during their senior week, uh, which we began with a, uh, the senior prom at the DCU Convention Center in Worcester, uh, followed by the uh, commemoration ceremony, which is a very special ceremony and tradition in Shrewsbury which was held at Mechanics Hall. Uh, they then the next evening had the uh, senior faculty dinner, the first time we'd be able to do that in a few years, uh, which was held at the uh, Best Western Royal Plaza in Marlboro, uh, and then uh, graduation, which was held uh, on the campus of Shrewsbury High School uh, in the stadium, uh, uh, which is something that uh, I continue to get a lot of feedback when I run into people in town that has a venue uh, that has been particularly well received. Uh, I want to uh, not only congratulate the graduates, uh, I want to thank uh, the administration and faculty of Shrewsbury High School, uh, particularly uh, Mr. O'Connell, the grade level administrator. There is a lot that goes into putting these together. Uh, he, along with the, uh, the, the class advisors, the rest of the administrative team, uh, and uh, Kathy Granados, the assistant to Mr. Bazidlo, uh, everyone put in a ton of time and effort to make sure these went off smoothly. And uh, uh, one thing that I'm particularly proud of uh, both as your superintendent and a parent of a graduate this year. Uh, these are, are really first-class ceremonies, uh, and I think our students and those in attendance conducting themselves with class, um, I think it reflects incredibly well upon not only our school district but our entire community, and uh, we were really pleased to be able to celebrate uh, in honor of the graduating class and wish them the best uh, going forward. Um, I also wanted to uh, make an announcement that we are going to uh, in the near future, align ourselves uh, with uh, a new uh, town hall schedule uh, that was just put into place this past week. Uh, those who may have seen the Board of Selectmen meeting recently, um, a report from Mr. Mizikar, the town manager, uh, effective last week, uh, the municipal departments here located in town hall shifted to a summer opening schedule, uh, which uh, provides some additional hours for residents to receive services uh, on Tuesday evenings with the town hall being open until 6.30 p.m. on Tuesdays. Um, and then uh, in turn closing early on Fridays uh, at noontime. Um, it is something that uh, you know, the school department office is located here and we did have a conversation with um, our uh, administrative assistant and clerical support staff uh, to see if this kind of uh, schedule might make sense. Um, this would not apply to the senior administration, the assistant superintendents, myself, and so forth, uh, but those who work uh, typically here in the school department office, and there was a lot of uh, positive sense, uh, both that we typically, at times during the summer, uh, have people who are trying to register for school the next year or otherwise uh, access the building uh, where they might need some extended hours. So the Tuesday extended hours seem very attractive. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as you might imagine, in the summertime, Friday afternoons, are, especially when school is out, are pretty dead. Uh, we, our summer programs don't operate on Fridays. Um, so we feel it also could be an effective uh, approach the way, uh, similar to the way the municipal departments are taking it. Uh, so my uh, intent is to have this schedule begin for the school department office uh, here at Town Hall, effective 
um, the week of June 20th. June 20th is actually a state holiday this year because it is Juneteenth uh, observed because Juneteenth, which is always on June 19th, falls on a Sunday. Um, so that uh, Tuesday, the 21st, would be the first extended hours Tuesday, um, and that coming Friday uh, would be uh, the first uh, that where we would close that office at noontime. Um, those employees in particular roles who the, the typical hours continue to make sense may stay with those. We'll flex that. Um, but uh, there was definitely interest, and it seems to make sense to align our opening hours with the, the town. Um, one other difference is that we would, uh, uh, the intent is that most likely uh, on the week of August 22nd, we'd resume uh, our normal hours. We might be, still be able to do extended hours on that Tuesday evening. We'll have to see how that plays out with employee availability. But that's the week when we start to really, uh, the schools start to reopen in terms of preparation for the new school year. And we, want, we don't want to be out of alignment um, with the school schedules and the school offices being open then. Um, and uh, with that, you know, barring any objection from the school committee, we will begin that schedule uh, the week of June 20th. Um, and that is superintendent's report this evening. Great. And I want to th thank you very much, Dr. Sawyer. Um, if there's no other comments on that matter, we welcomed it. I think we are in support. Um, our next item on the agenda is a time scheduled appointment and it's an acceptance of a gift. This will be we will be looking for a vote per school committee policy uh, 911. Gifts over five thousand dollars must be formally accepted by the school committee. Uh, in this case, uh, Danielle and Greg Wolfus have offered to make a gift of up to $30,000 for the Shrewsbury Public Schools to fund the online tool Empower You for students in the class of uh, 2022. We did receive a memo about this in our packet, and Dr. Sawyer, I wonder if you want to help explain what this is about before we uh, call for a vote of this generous gift. Thank you. Uh, we're very appreciative, and we had been in conversations uh, at different points over the course of the year. Uh, with Daniel and Greg Wolfus, and many know, but if, for those who don't, uh, their daughter Zoe uh, was a member of the class of 2022 uh, who died by suicide uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and uh, Greg and Danielle uh, started the Celebrate Zoe's Life Fund uh, to fund mental health initiatives. Um, and we were looking for ways uh, to support, uh, and we will continue to look for ways uh, to work in collaboration with them uh, to find uh, uses where those funds may support uh, Shrewsbury students' uh, mental health and well-being and building resilient skills. Uh, we were particularly interested in looking to do something for the class of 2022, given that Zoe uh, was a beloved classmate. And we uh, uh, were made aware of a tool that's known as Empower You, uh, which is essentially a, a six-week online course uh, that teaches uh, uh, skills in terms of building resilience, and mental well-being, uh, and uh, it's actually a unique program. I've not seen one like it before, where not only is it an online program that provides very specific uh, uh, small dose kinds of lessons a few times a week um, uh, using an online platform format, uh, but also uh, each student then is tied to the same master's level uh, counselor uh, with whom they interact online during that six weeks uh, as well, who give them feedback on uh, what they uh, enter into the system in terms of their goals and how they're doing towards building skills, uh, which uh, uh, the, the, the research uh, that the company uh, has provided uh, indicates that um, there's been a lot of success in terms of the students who have used it. The program originated out of Minnesota. Uh, I'm going to project my screen here uh, in a moment to just to show you what the uh, page that's been constructed that we will send out to uh, our members of the class of 22 and their families. Um, and so, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the, the tagline for the Empower You organization is Resilience, Persistence, and Success. Um, and this is a mental health motivation and well-being program that's specifically for members of the Shrewsbury class of 2022 to complete uh, during their summer weeks. It's, it's available, it's not a requirement, of course, um, but it will be available free of charge to any uh, graduate who is interested in participating. Um, and again, it's essentially 20 minutes a few times a week, so it's small doses. Um, it's a research-based uh, program, uh, and again, there is uh, interaction uh, with uh, a master's degree uh, level uh, counselor. Um, so it's uh, something that we're really pleased to, uh, and there's no way we would have the capacity to offer this without the generosity of the Wolfuses should the uh, school committee see fit uh, this evening to accept uh, their donation. We will only be charged for the actual students who are uh, sign up and participate. Um, and uh, the amount being 
uh, provided by the Wolfes would allow uh, roughly up to about 200 members of the class. Um, we've never done this before, of course. We don't know how many people will take advantage. We'll be promoting it not only through an email uh, communications, but we'll also be doing some peer-to-peer -peer, uh, social media communication among the class as well, and we're looking for students to um, uh, make sure that their classmates are aware. Um, so again, it's something that is, uh, uh, we know that the mental health crisis uh, among young people is not limited to high school students. It's certainly a reality for college age students as well. Uh, the vast majority of our students will be going on to college next year. Some will be going into the military or the workforce. Uh, but we thought it was something that was worth um, offering and we're hoping many uh, take advantage of it. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions the committee has at this time. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Any questions? Any members? No. Um, uh, certainly, before I take a motion, um, the generosity of the Wolfes uh, can't be understated here, and the desire to do something meaningful for Zoe's class is certainly appreciated, I know, by everybody here. Um, with that, then, I'd be seeking a um, motion that the school committee vote to accept the donation from Danielle and Greg Wolfes of up to $30,000 to fund access to the online empowerment, excuse me, online tool Empower You uh, for students in the class of uh, 20, uh, 2022 prayer are enclosed memorandum. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed? <laughs> that motion passes unanimously. Dr. Sawyer, thank you very much, and please thank do you. pass our support on to the Wolfesses, of course. I will certainly do that. <coughs> our next time scheduled appointment is a student recognition of the speech and, and debate champions. Uh, not the team, aren't our champions, and we have a few students with us this evening. So our high school speech and debate team, while they're on their way up here, under ably directed uh, under our coach, Rich Atelli, are enjoyed another successful year. So I understand we have some champions here, and I'd welcome maybe some introductions. It looks like your championship was on April 9th of uh, 2022 at Acton Boxborough. So please, uh, glad to have you here. Maybe some introductions and tell us a little bit about how your year has been. Sure, thank you very much. I'm Mark Ricciatelli, coach of the high school speech and debate team. Uh, thanks for having us here again. We're always happy to come and present state champions uh, to the committee and, and to the town. Uh, junior, incoming senior, senior uh, Shalini Bijou and recent class of 2022 graduate, Rithika Prasad, are perfect representations of the success of our high school speech and debate team. Uh, they are number one and two as far as degrees in the National Forensic League, which is the National Honor Society of High School Speech and Debate. They've each earned the degree of premier distinction, and they both earned that their junior year. And prior to their 2022 individual state champion titles, at the very beginning of this season, uh, they were recognized by the National Speech and Debate Association with a special speaking and service award uh, for the prior year, for the 2020-2021 school year. Students earn this award when they reach the maximum number of service points in the Honor Society in any given uh, school year. For more than 140,000 members in the National Speech and Debate Association, fewer than 140 students received this recognition uh, over that school year. In a letter announcing the award, the National Director noted, as members of the Honor Society, National Speech and Debate Association members are held to our code of honor and the higher standards of service. The code states that at all times a member is prepared to work constructively to improve the lives of others. In earning this award, Rithika Prasad and Shalini Bijou have demonstrated their commitment to using their skills to help their peers, community, and the activity. I can tell you firsthand that Rithika and Shalini have been active role models uh, to their fellow teammates. Uh, they lead not only by example with their own competitive success, uh, but they take a genuine interest uh, in coaching their peers uh, and having them uh, celebrate, they celebrate their peers' success as well. Shalini was the 2022 Massachusetts State Champion in informative speaking, because you can enter multiple events if you qualify at state. She was also third in original oratory at the same state tournament in April. Uh, you may remember she was also the 2021 national runner-up, second in the country uh, last year in expository speaking. And next week she'll be traveling with some other members of the team to Louisville, Kentucky, where she'll compete in original oratory at nationals. 
Rithika was the 2022 Massachusetts state champion in extemporaneous speaking. It's a category that I know is near and dear to the heart of a particular member of this board. Uh, <laughs> she was also double entered and placed third in impromptu speaking as well. And because of their success, they each earned a special award at, at states uh, for being the top, among the top competitors there uh, on that day uh, for their combined success overall. Uh, Rithika's versatility is also shown by the fact that she competed in a separate state tournament, our state debate tournament, which is held, was held the end of March uh, in a public forum debate. And she can probably count on one hand the number of times she's competed in public forum debate. Uh, so we entered her as a wild card with a partner. And her and her partner placed in the top uh, 16 public forum teams uh, in the state. And I don't know how many weren't in there, but uh, public forum is a huge event in the state. I believe also Rithika placed either first or second in extemporaneous speaking throughout the entire uh, season at all the local tournaments she attended. I'm going to let each of them talk to you about their event. Uh, I'll let Charlene talk about her informative speech topic, and maybe she can talk about her original oratory topic as well. We'll see if Rithika remembers her winning extemp question and, or her answer. Uh, and then they're happy to answer any questions you have, as am I. Wonderful. Welcome to this public forum. Uh, so, Tag, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, my informative speech topic this year was on e commerce and basically like online shopping. And I talked about how like companies use websites to kind of like manipulate you into like buying their products and things like that. And I also talked about the environmental impact of um, online shopping and returns and things like that. Uh, my original oratory topic was on diversity in journalism and how we don't have enough minorities in not only journalism but in the newsroom and also in the entertainment industry and how that shapes perspectives for young kids similar to me like growing up and um, both of my speeches were ones that I spent a lot of time writing and both are topics that I'm very passionate about as well. Um, so my final extem question, the topic area was state issues, so it was issues from all across the states in the U.S., and mine was on Maryland, and it essentially was asking about the criminal justice system, especially among juveniles, because they have an issue where young kids are being placed into jail for small offenses, and they're missing four or five years of their life. So the question was, how can we tackle that, and what's the solution in the future? And I believe I answered it with rehabilitation, improving education systems. So that's all I really remember. <laughs> Can I explain how extemp works? Oh, yeah. So the category itself is a limited prep event where essentially you need to have a knowledge of current events and also being able to think on the spot. So there's different topic areas like foreign economics, foreign leaders, and you draw three questions. And the questions are, you know, should the United States increase interest rates? How can we combat terrorism in Somalia? And you have 30 minutes to come up with a cohesive seven minute speech answering the question. You can't see the people behind you, but they're going, <laughs> right, seven minutes, Somalia. We know how to do that. <laughs> I, um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know if you had, you had more. It's lovely to have you here. I would welcome, I know my colleagues. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, ha to have you here. Any, any comments or questions? Please. Uh, congratulations, and uh, Mr. Ricciatelli is your biggest supporter. He always sends us <laughs> detailed emails, which is wonderful. So we always know what's going on, and it's, I, you're a frequent flyer. You're always here. I mean, you, thank you for everything you do, and I think you know, from a parent's perspective, when I, you know, 30 minutes to prepare, <laughs> I, I, that's just, I mean, I know you're doing a lot behind the scenes, but still, that's a lot of work, and um, you represent a, this community and this school district very well, so congratulations. Thank you. Please. I'd just like to congratulate you both and Coach Ricciatelli as well. I always appreciate the emails you send us. Um, I'm always amazed at the sustained success of this group, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Every year, yeah. uh, the, uh, the accomplishments of this team are outstanding. Uh, the e-commerce topic is very near and dear to my heart because I've been in that space for the last seven years as a career. I'm not going to start the debate because it might be <laughs> I, I think you're onto something there. Uh, but uh, and, and I also think it's important for everybody to know the, the hours that you're putting into this uh, don't go unrecognized. I know mm -hmm. in the 10 or 15 meetings I've had in the high school, 
uh, over the last year. I'm always passing by uh, either you or your teammates who are rehearsing in the hallways uh, <laughs> late at night, and uh, it is just uh, very impressive. So congratulations to you all. Thank you. Mark, I'm pleased you finally managed to bring an extemper for us, which is uh, the best category. So congratulations to you both. But uh, Rithika, in particular, uh, extemp is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm going to make the same comment that I make every year just for everyone who's impressed with the, what these kids do at home. Shrewsbury's speech and debate program is still, I assume, practicing one night per week, Mark? Correct. Shrewsbury speech and debate students. Shrewsbury speech and debate is a powerhouse statewide and nationally, and our students who practice one evening a week are regularly uh, upstaging students from elite private academies who have speech and debate as core coursework that they take every day with instruction. So this, if you thought this was an impressive program and impressive kids uh, already, you don't know the half of it. So mm -hmm. congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're very lucky to also have several volunteer assistant right. coaches. Yeah. Can't do it alone. <laughs> Well, I, certainly. Uh, so similarly, you're interested in e-commerce. Yeah. My my career began in the juvenile justice system and working with, with with kids in that system. So near and dear to my heart, how do we reduce incarceration of of, of kids across America? So uh, just wonderful topics. But it, most importantly, you you represent really both as a program, but then individually, what we're hoping for for all of our young people that they have unique opportunities to kind of develop their skills. Um, we're very, very proud of you. Um, I, I both, both Rithika and, and Shalini, I wonder for, for our senior, what's, what, what, what's next for you? We can't help but ask, it's, it's, it's our job to know what, what, what's next. So I'm actually attending Northeastern University um, with a major in data science and health science. So very excited. Well, we wish you congratulations. We will see you again next year. We have no doubt. Uh, and uh, and I know, Dr. Sawyer. I think we have we ha we have some things. But let me turn it over to you. We do. <laughs> just a couple of comments, uh, just to echo everyone's sentiments. And we're so proud of the work you and your teammates have done. Um, as I think Coach Rusatelli mentioned, uh, the team itself came in second in, in the state. They've been routinely uh, in the very tops mm -hmm. among the state uh, as as an entire team. Uh, but certainly the the individual accomplishments. Uh, that Shalini and Rithika uh, had were just extraordinary, uh, and it's really uh, uh, our privilege to honor you here this evening. Um, and uh, it's really uh, extraordinary work, and, and I think that um, you know not only intellectually, uh, but to, to build the kind of skill set that you have uh, through your experience in speech and debate, going all the way back to thanking the folks at the middle school level who begin uh, at Oak and then up through the high school. Um, it's really a remarkable program with a wonderful culture. So congratulations to each of you. And in a moment, we'll ask you to come up and uh, be thanked by the committee and receive a couple of, of certificates. Um, but before that, it, I think it's also important uh, to recognize um, all the coaches, of course, who have spent a lot of time and effort uh, assisting our students uh, over the course of the season. Um, and the, the success of the program is a reflection of that work. Uh, but in particular, uh, Mark Ricciatelli. Uh, Mark uh, made us aware a while back uh, that this is his last season uh, coaching the Shrewsbury High Coming School up. Speech and Debate Team. Uh, and uh, it's uh, something that uh, uh, he leaves. He, he has, uh, he is among the most successful coaches in the United States of America. Uh, and uh, the way they keep track, uh, you know, he's certainly earned accolades and uh, uh, recognition uh, that is uh, really uh, unbelievable uh, for, for someone who's done this for, for a number of years. How many years now, Mark, have you been the coach? Uh, this is the end of coaching this team in some capacity. It's my 34th year. I started volunteering right out of high school. <laughs> so um, next, so, so I will be finishing in 35 years. <laughs> so it's, it's a, a really uh, um, an incredible uh, run that, that he's had and has made an impact on, uh, you know, prob beyond hundreds, probably in the thousands of students at this point um, and uh, uh, in such a positive way. But additionally to that, uh, this past year, and uh, haven't had a chance to see, uh, Mr. Stelly has another job. He does not work for the school district other than coaching speech and debate. Uh, but uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I had the pleasure of delivering uh, awards around the district, uh, and uh, the Shrewsbury Education Foundation recognized uh, Coach Ricciatelli with one of its John P. Collins Awards for Excellence uh, as an Unsung Hero. Uh, and I do have that uh, award here to present to Mr. Ricciatelli tonight. So uh, can we have a round of applause for Coach Ricciatelli? <laughs> uh, and 
and uh, as well, also a round of applause for Shalini and Ruthika for mm -hmm. their campaign. So at this time, if the three of you would like to come, shake the hands of the committee or fist bump or elbow bump, whatever you're comfortable <laughs> doing, and uh, receive these awards. Thank you again, um, and I, uh, we're moving from recognizing students to recognizing some faculty. So our, our uh, next agenda item um, is our staff recognition of our retirees. And so we have 18 staff um, who are ending their educational careers uh, with some deserved retirement. And uh, uh, Ms. Malone, I welcome your ability to w walk us through I, the, those who are here and maybe those who also are, are, are not, and we look forward to, to hearing from them, as is our tradition. So we have 18 staff ending their education careers um, with a well-deserved retirement, except when we suck them back in to be subs. And I believe we have an offer on the table already for, one of them, <laughs> for the fall to cover a maternity leave. So uh, we don't really let them go. Um, this total represents an average of 25.78 years of service in Shrewsbury and does not include actually their prior educational experience in other districts. So we wish them a healthy, happy, and fun retirement, again, except when they come back to <laughs> help us out. So we're going to start. We have one person in the administrative assistant category. That's Deb Maroney. She has served 30 years in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as an administrative assistant from Oak Middle School. So thank you to Deb. And I, I should mention that we do have some people who are going to speak. Most are not going to speak. We were fortunate to have a few who are willing to speak. So when we get to them, they'll come forward. Um, so in the paraprofessional category, we have most of these um, individuals here tonight. Doreen Kelly has served 22 years as a paraprofessional in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as a child-specific assistant from Sherwood Middle School. Thank you, Doreen. Joan Markham has served 23 years as a paraprofessional, with 20 of those years here in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as an instructional assistant from Floral Street School. <laughs> Doris Sullivan has served 22 years as a paraprofessional in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as an instructional assistant from the Walter J. Patton School. Joni Theodos has served 20 years as an educator and paraprofessional, with 12 of those years here in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as, as a special education assistant from Sherwood Middle School. <laughs> Sue Tedisco has served 24 years as a paraprofessional in Shrewsbury. She is retiring, this is hard to believe, she is retiring as an ABA technician from the Calvin Coolidge School. <laughs> so now we're going to move to our teachers and our professional staff. Susan Bastardo has served 39 years as an educator, with 34 of those years here in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as a speech-language pathologist from the major Howard W. Beale School. Helene Biscaglia has served 19 years as an educator in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as a third grade teacher from Floral Street School. <laughs> and the next person is going to speak, so I'd like to invite up Lubaina Musa <coughs> has served 40 years as an educator, with 30 of those years here in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as an occupational therapist from the Parker Road Preschool 
and the major Howard W. Beale School, and she is also the lead occupational therapist for the district. Lubaina, are you here? That's Lubaina. Just come right up here. Have a seat. I couldn't resist. I just couldn't resist. We're so glad you're speaking. <laughs> for those who know me, they know I couldn't resist. So, and I'm going to try to keep the tears away. So when Barb asked if we would like to speak for a couple of minutes at this meeting, I jumped right in and volunteered. And the reason I did that was not to recount my almost 30-year really joyful experience in the Shrewsbury schools. It was simply to be in a public forum with administrators so that I could express my gratitude to all of you. I know the limelight is usually on the educators, support staff, and students in the district because we do outnumber you. <laughs> but if it, if it wasn't for this small group of dedicated education leaders, many of who are present here, we could not do our job of serving the students at the level of excellence that has been set and is expected in this district. Dr. Sawyer, Meg, SPED directors, Pat, Amy, Barb, Bridget, Chris, and members of the school committee. Thank you for your support of our work. Our jobs are not easy, but then neither are yours. If we want it easy, we would likely not be in education. <laughs> but here we are together striving to do the best for our students. Once again, this moment is about acknowledging you all, thanking you for your leadership, your hard behind the scenes work, and expressing from my heart what a privilege my journey in Shrewsbury has been. <laughs> Rewarding at every level and an opportunity to serve that has been my blessing. Thank you. Thank you. And we have another speaker, Ann Egan. Ann Egan has served 36 years as an educator, with 32 of those years here in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as a grade six math and science teacher from Sherwood Middle School. Ann. Good evening, school committee members, administrators, colleagues. Thank you for offering me the opportunity to join you tonight. I'm so grateful to you for welcoming me into the Shrewsbury, your Shrewsbury community 33 years ago. Over that time, you have always supported, challenged, and encouraged me to try new things. I have loved my students, their families, and the staff. They have always been by my side through thick and thin. To work in Shrewsbury is to be at the forefront of innovation. As a result, I've had the opportunity to explore a wide variety of new approaches and designed to meet the portrait of a Shrewsbury graduate. Several years ago, this took a more personal turn. As we developed a relationship with the Rail Trail Flatbread Company, our students competed to design and pitch a flatbread recipe to owners and chefs of the restaurant. The winner of the flatbread competition was selected and their product was featured at the Hudson restaurant. The business connection was natural as my son, who graduated with a degree in food marketing, worked for the Rail Trail Flatbread Company and showed up with his crew and listened to the presentations and offered feedback. Little did I know that the biggest winner wasn't my students, it was my son. This experience created a passion and led him to return to school where he received a degree in education. He's now completing his first year as a teacher in the Shrewsbury Public Schools. The strong connection with our community at large extends our influence beyond our classrooms and affects each one of us in a personal way. 
Shrewsbury has blessed me with an exciting and rewarding career. I have always loved my job and those I've worked with. Thank you for making this a reality. Ann Heinen has served 22 years as an educator, with 21 of those years here in Shrewsbury. She is reti retiring as a preschool teacher from Parker Road Preschool. <laughs> Mary Lou Luco has served 45 years as an educator, with 35 of those years here in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as a world languages teacher from Oak Middle School. Lucy Marsigliano has served 30 years as an educator in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as a grade five English language arts and social studies teacher from Sherwood Middle School. <laughs> Victoria McCarthy has served 33 years as an educator with 25 of those years here in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as a grade five math and science teacher from Sherwood Middle School. <laughs> Tina McGrail has served 22 years as an educator in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as a grade one teacher from Floral Street School. <laughs> We have another speaker. Elizabeth McRae has served 23 years as an educator in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as a grade one teacher from Spring Street School. Hello everyone, thank you very much for inviting me to share a little bit of my thoughts and feelings about retiring. Um, it was August of 1998 and I was getting our three girls ready to start back to school. Ava, our youngest, was going off to Beale for half-day kindergarten, and I was really looking forward to having mornings to myself for the first time in a very long time. And the phone rang, and B.J. Lates, the principal at Spring Street School, was calling to ask if I was interested in a job as a classroom aide. I volunteered a lot at Spring Street, so I said if I could share the job with somebody, I would do it. And in stepped Rosemary Royer, and she and I job shared that year. We were assigned to a classroom with two teachers who were sharing a third grade teaching position, Jane Lazat and Lisa McCubrey. <laughs> <laughs> I loved working with the young children and Jane and Lisa that year. I loved it so much that a few years later I went back to school for te a teaching degree and then I was hired by Jane Lazat, <laughs> that by then she was Spring Street School's principal, for a third grade teaching position and I've been there ever since. Whether I've been a parent volunteer, or a classroom aide, or a one-on-one -on -one aide, or a student teacher, <laughs> or a long-term substitute teacher, or a classroom teacher, the one thing that has stayed constant is I love working with children, and I treasure all the relationships I've developed with my students, and their parents, and all of my colleagues. In the past two years, my husband and I have been blessed with four grandchildren. <laughs> and soon, Ava, that little kindergartner, will be blessing us with a fifth. <laughs> So all this has turned my head in the direction of being a Grammy. <laughs> Thank you to Brian Maybe, my principal for over a decade. She's the best. <laughs> Thank you for your strong and steady support. It's been some hard times sometimes being a teacher and he's, he's the best. Thank you to Dr. Sawyer for being such a rock solid leader, especially these past few years. Thank you to Shrewsbury Public Schools. Keep up the great work. I'll miss you all very much. <laughs> supposed to not cry up here. <laughs> <laughs> Carmen Tomlinson has served 27 years as an educator in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as a world languages teacher from Oak Middle School. <laughs> and finally, as you maybe have heard, we have an administra administrator retiring. <laughs> Dr. Ann Jones has served 27 years as an educator in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as the principal of Oak Middle School. Hi, Annie. 
I had known the speech girls with who who did the extemporaneous speech. With, <laughs> with, I could have used her about two hours ago. <laughs> um, thank you for having me uh, tonight. Uh, really, there's just a whole slew of people that I want to thank tonight. First of all, the school committee, um, Dr. Sawyer, Central Office Administrators, Barb, for your unwavering support um, and for fostering a school district that truly lives up to its core values. Uh, that has meant so much to me over the years. Um, my principal colleagues, many of whom are here tonight, um, and the leadership team that we work as, I have learned so much from all of you, um, especially my former principal, Dr. Jane Lazat. <laughs> Um, and Todd Bazzillo, who both have uh, definitely uh, been there to lend a sympathetic ear and both who truly understand and appreciate the challenges of, of middle and secondary education. Your guidance has been invaluable. Um, I want to also recognize the Oak Leadership Team. Uh, Ann Kirchie, Scott Yonker, Patty Waterhouse, who's here tonight. Um, the curriculum coordinators, the counselors, and all of those whose expertise and wisdom I have depended on day in and day out to lead Oak Middle School. I definitely couldn't have done it without them. Um, I want to acknowledge the amazing Oak faculty of middle school educators. Um, the staff is amazing, parents, students. I am so grateful for the trust you have placed in me to lead Oak Middle School. Thank you. Uh, and from all of these people who I've learned so much from over the years, uh, I couldn't have asked for a more rewarding career. Um, and uh, it, it's truly been a journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I would like. Would you like to invite the educators up? Sure. I, yes, I, and we have a gift for them, but there may be some comments. From yes, them. and I would okay, welcome great. maybe just before we do that. Any comments from our, please? <laughs> just congratulations to everyone retiring. I know um, when we get the list every year, it's bittersweet because we see these names of these amazing educators who have done so much for so many years for some of our children, for us in this role. Um, and I do think the past two years have been more difficult than anything and that you've all weathered it and you are well deserving of these retirements but the school district isn't the buildings it's the teachers it's the education so thank you for everything and you will all be missed yeah i'd just like to thank you all for your commitment to our students and to our town um it's just amazing to see that anywhere from 19 to 45 years you've you spent in shrewsbury uh, so appreciate uh, all the work uh, and dedication you've provided the success you provided all our students uh, very much appreciated so thank you so much I, I would certainly just echo those comments uh, part of what we received from um, Ms. Malone was that collectively you've served 464 years uh, in Shrewsbury <laughs> so uh, that's a that is either quite a sentence or quite just quite a, a commitment to service to our community and the number of children and families that you have touched is in, innumerable so thank you all for all of it we certainly wish you a good retirement. And if Barb begs you to come back, you can say no. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome to. Uh, but, but it is just because of, of what the, really the gifts that you've given us. So thank you very much. And Dr. Sawyer, maybe you can help us figure out how to coordinate ourselves. Sure. If, if you just allow me of course. Uh, oh, yes, a of couple course. of, of, of uh, comments. Uh, first off, thank you for all you've done uh, for the children of the Shrewsbury Public Schools, uh, as well as your colleagues, families, the community. Uh, our, our schools are what they are because of the work that you do and have done. Uh, all of you have made a difference. That's why you all got into this work in the first place. I had the great pleasure of actually hiring some of you uh, as paraprofessionals when I was an administrator at Floral Street School. Uh, some of you as teachers. There, there uh, has been, uh, it, it's, it's been my privilege uh, over the past uh, 25 years to, to work with you uh, in this really important work that we do for the, for the community. Um, as was mentioned, over four centuries of institutional knowledge uh, is leaving with you, uh, which, which on the one hand uh, concerns me uh, from my perspective, <laughs> at the other hand, but, I, but I'm not worried because I know all of you uh, are the kind of uh, professionals who have 
given that knowledge and shared that knowledge with your colleagues. Um, and so I, I am always impressed how our veteran uh, educators and, and support staff uh, take our newer educators under their wing uh, and uh, as staff come on board and, and they learn from them and from each other. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, to me, uh, it, this is not a case of people who are just, you know, looking at the clock and the calendar or counting down the days. All of you have just had energy uh, that you've put towards making uh, our schools better uh, and ultimately a better place for our kids. Uh, so I could not be more grateful. And uh, you know, as you uh, reflect back on your career, uh, you know, th there's, there's value in all work no matter what the job is that people do. Uh, but uh, one thing that's very special about being uh, someone who educates children uh, is that uh, you never have to look back and wonder, uh, did I do something important with my career? Uh, you did something incredibly important. So thank you. Um, and at this time, uh, we would ask that you come up and uh, shake the hands of the committee. And we have a, a small token of our appreciation as a school district to, to give to you as well. Uh, so how about one more round of applause? For Again, thank all of our retirees, and I'm going to turn it over to There we go. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to move to our next item on the agenda. Have a lovely evening, uh, and that is our uh, district response to the pandemic. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, we're going to do the district response to the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Sawyer, I'm going to turn it over to you for a report for our community. Thank you. From the sublime to the not so fun. <laughs> uh, as far as this is our weekly or every time we have a meeting uh, report on what our most recent COVID statistics are. Uh, just a reminder that our goal throughout the school year has been to maintain in-person uh, full-time learning for students with minimal disruptions and minimizing uh, the risk of contracting COVID-19 at school. Uh, I think we've done a very good job with that. Uh, our approach uh, has been, you know, again, implementing strategies to reduce the risk of transmission, uh, working to create a sense of belonging and supporting students' social, emotional, and mental health needs, and providing learning opportunities that support our students' academic needs as well. Uh, you can see this is the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University uh, Center's uh, statistic regarding uh, positivity rate uh, of interest is that uh, several states are no longer reporting out this out. Uh, so the, the states that are remaining, uh, Massachusetts actually has the second lowest rate. All of them, I believe it's 35 of them, have an above the 5% threshold. Uh, but Massachusetts has dropped back since the last time we reported. 
um, as you can see on this next slide, uh, has gone back down to 6% from 9% uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that's uh, hopefully will become a trend uh, moving down lower. Uh, in terms of uh, cases by age, uh, the numbers have come down a bit uh, in terms of ages 0 to 9. Uh, 10 to 19, uh, they've also come down by about 1,400 cases. So that's uh, good news. Uh, and you can see uh, the majority of cases are with those in the 20 to 39 age group. As far as hospital admissions, they remain very rare for young people in particular, uh, much more common in those who are the most elderly in our, in our community. Uh, it's uh, up just a titch uh, for 0 to 11 years old, uh, and then uh, it's up a bit for 12 to 17. Of course, hospitalizations tend to follow or trail uh, when there are spikes in the number of cases. Uh, but this, again, is based on a per 100,000 people, so it's a very small number uh, who are being hospitalized. Uh, for younger people. The wastewater monitoring uh, numbers continue to, to stay low. They've moved down uh, to a degree it's hard to tell from the slides and popped up a tiny bit, I think, in the Boston, uh, but again, well, well below where we were uh, back in uh, December and January. Locally, uh, the town reported 77 cases for the week ending June 3rd, where we had 37 cases reported in Shrewsbury. Uh, unlike in past months, these have been really decoupled in that uh, most of those who are reporting directly to us are reporting rapid tests uh, that are likely not even end necessarily ending up in the system um, as far as the public health system that where the town of Shrewsbury reports. Uh, but uh, you can see the number uh, was trending uh, downward uh, or moving downward, which is a good, good news story. Uh, the average positivity rate for June among uh, students uh, was uh, six-tenths of one percent. Uh, the 14-day positive test rate last published at the end of May was 12%. Uh, given that Massachusetts has come down to 6%, we'll expect that to start trending uh, in the lower direction. This is a statistic that trails a little bit uh, chronologically. In terms of our current case count uh, this week, uh, which is from Saturday through today at 1 p.m., uh, we've had 24 cases, uh, which brings us to uh, about uh, just you know, 2,746 cases since the start of the school year. Uh, and uh, uh, again, for this week, we're in a little better position than we were previous. Uh, you can see our daily numbers here uh, over time. Um, and then on a weekly basis, uh, we uh, had about half as many cases for the last week uh, reporting compared to the previous week. Um, and we're uh, right now again at about 24 or so cases. Hopefully that number will be lower than 52 when we close the books on Friday. This is our display that we provide for the number of cases by school. And then you can see across uh, grade levels in terms of age, uh, largest number of cases by grade uh, remain at the upper elementary, early middle school grades. This is just the breakdown of uh, number of students and number of staff who presented with cases this year. As far as absenteeism, that's improved in June. Uh, the uh, absentee rate for June right now is 4% uh, as compared to 6% where it was trending in April and May. You can see that graphically here on a day-by-day -day basis. So again, our goal has been to, to maintain uh, our in-person learning. Uh, we are coming to the close of the, of the school year. Uh, we do have another, uh, one more school committee meeting a week from tonight. I will present our most updated data at that point. Uh, but uh, the good news story is that uh, although certainly there have been disruptions with absenteeism when staff or students contract and need to isolate, uh, you know, certainly uh, given the fact that uh, we did not know what the landscape was going to look like when we started the school year back in uh, late August, and uh, you know, we're very grateful uh, that we have been able to maintain our, our in-person uh, full-time education throughout the year. Uh, and our staff has definitely done a wonderful job and our parent family supporting us and the kids themselves adapting uh, as need be uh, to absences that are caused uh, and, and we still continue. Uh, you know, we have not had, uh, we, we have not had uh, significant uh, negative health effects. Um, you know, I don't want to discount that, that we do have you know, a, a small percentage of people that we've been made aware may be experiencing symptoms of long COVID, for example. Uh, but as far as hospitalizations, uh, 
we, we have not had a hospitalization of a student to date. Uh, and uh, we've had uh, a couple of situations, uh, I believe, over the course of the year with staff that were very uh, you know, short-term uh, uh, precautionary kinds of visits. And uh, uh, we, you know, hopeful we'll get to the rest of this year and we will continue to monitor what this is like and how things are, are moving forward. Uh, I think it's become somewhat of a, a stable situation uh, where we're, we're working through it on a, continue to do that on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or hear any comments the committee would like to add. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I, I, I will just note, um, as, a, as a family that has recently been struggling through COVID over the last month or so, I, I do just want to take a moment to acknowledge our incredible nursing team, which uh, many times you have brought up, but just call that out again. And uh, I see Dr. Lazat here. When I had to call uh, Ms. Smith, and I was panicking as a mother of what my of, a child I had sent to school with COVID and had to go and pick her up when I realized what I had done as the chair of the school committee, uh, feeling particularly ashamed uh, that, that I was in that moment. And what she said is, we don't panic over COVID anymore. That's not what we do. And I, it was very calming. But knowing that 2,700 young people who have gone through this and the number and hundreds of calls that those those nurses in particular, along with the teachers supporting them, but have helped our families through um, what is what is complicated and highly disruptive. And to your point, um, for the vast majority of them, not leading to these terrible medical complications, but causing all kinds of difficulty for, for young people and their ability to really step forward for our kids and their parents. I just want to just acknowledge that. So um, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sawyer. With that, uh, uh, I see we have some guests with us tonight for the next uh, next item, and this is our report on our teacher diversification project. And um, I would welcome um, Ms. Malone, and I'm not sure, I think we, are, we have some, definitely some members of your committee here with us, along with 102 other Massachusetts districts and charter school teams, the Shrewsbury Public Schools participated in the teacher diversification project sponsored by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education with the goal of giving districts the um, development and tools to envision their own path to diversification of our teacher workforce. We did receive a report in our packet, but we look forward to hearing from many of you. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly who we have with us this evening, so I'd welcome some introductions to get, a, to get us going. And we're really appreciative of your being here and doing this important work for us. <clears throat> no problem. And I'm just going to ask that microphone and to get a little closer to you, Barb, if you're going to speak. <laughs> Mara, could you just move the microphone right to the table where Barb is? Thank you. Well, Mara's going to speak first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's, you. there's a way to pass the buck. <laughs> um, thank you for having, uh, inviting us all to your meeting tonight. Um, I am Maura Egan, and... Um, I was part of the teacher diversification pro project. Um, and tonight we'll be sharing uh, information regarding six topics, and we'll have time for answering questions at the end. Um, as you can see on our agenda, uh, the topics uh, include our introductions, uh, the teacher diversification project and what it is, um, diversity data, um, what we have learned, uh, short-term goals and long-term goals for um, next steps uh, as we move forward uh, in this process. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing the team. Um, I am Maura Egan. I am a English teacher at Oak Middle School. Uh, Chris Girardi is here and he is principal at Beale School. Uh, now Wynn is not with us tonight. She is an assistant principal at Shrewsbury High School. Barb Malone, Executive Director of Human Resources for Shrewsbury Public Schools and our leader. Um, Kara Richardson, who is also not able to be with us tonight. She's a school adjustment counselor at Patton School. Denise Satterfield, who's a math teacher um, at Shrewsbury High School. Um, Tiffany Vega, who's a school counselor at Shrewsbury High School. And Patty Waterhouse, who is the Director of Middle School Special Education. I wanted to talk a little bit about where we've been with the school committee. Um, back on October 6th, I met with you all, and at that point, we had just started putting some of our rules up on imdiversity.com to try to attract more candidates. Um, and I reported that 
um, 17 percent just of our new hires um, self-reported in diverse federal categories during the height of the hiring season, July 1st to September 1st, which almost everyone's start dates um, started uh, during that time, as compared to 5.3 percent July 1st to September 1st in 2018. So we knew we were getting a little bit of traction um, with our newest hires last year. Um, and at, in that presentation, I mentioned that upcoming for the 22-23 year, that the Department of um, Elementary and Secondary Education was putting together a professional learning community um, to discuss diversity in education, really help districts. So um, we are back tonight to talk about what happened with that. Okay, so it's thank you. Good. Yeah, okay. if you can pull that one closer, that does help. Those those ones in the middle will pick up a much broader area. Than okay, those. thanks. Here we go. So it's always great when our goals are supported by the Department of Education's goals, <laughs> and this is one of those cases where uh, they identified that um, across the state we are not as the, we do not have as diverse of a teaching staff as our students are. So sponsored by this, the Department of Education, they put together the Teacher Diversification Project. Um, it's a project that's led by the department and the new teacher project, uh, Reimagine Teaching. And um, I think as you had shared, Lindsay, that we are one of 100 and 102 uh, districts across the state who are participating in this project. It's a, it's a very, um, significant project that the Department of Education is putting time and effort into, and we have participated in the first year of that project. So where we are, um, we've invested a good amount of time. The, the folks here uh, have attended eight, uh, we just finished our eighth session, eight three-hour sessions with the Department of Education and the other 102 districts across the state uh, to uh, really begin working on our diversification projects. Um, so I'll, I'll let Barb and, and the folks speak to this, uh, but some of the topics we've covered is that we understand why teacher racial and ethnic diversity matter uh, to your students in your district, uh, to audit, audit our current talent management processes and understand the experience uh, our stakeholders have and set some goals adjust our talent uh, practices, and create a long-term diversification strategy. And for those who are interested, um, the guiding workbook that we used is available. It's a link on the DESE website. So anyone in the public who's interested can um, look this up and, and read the workbook for more information. Okay, and this is me. I'm just gonna talk to the data. Um, this is pulled directly from the Massachusetts uh, Department of Education's website. Um, so this is our enrollment data for our district. And these are the students um, of different racial backgrounds. And as you can see, there are different categories that students can choose. So African American, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, white, um, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, multi-race, non-Hispanic. So I just, the group wanted me to speak to um, a discrepancy here or a flaw. Oh, I just want to go back really good. Okay. Um, there's no category that says um, Latino, which Brazilian students fall under that category. So I think they, they would be confused about what category to choose for themselves. So I don't think we would even know what category they would choose. Um, so they could be under the white category. So I don't think the data is completely accurate or reflects our a student body for the Brazilian students. Um, I think we can. So this is the um, data for the staff, um, the different racial backgrounds that staff selected when asked the question about racial backgrounds. So again, all of the same categories. And as you can see, our district uh, for the students is a lot more diverse um, than the staff in our district. So for students, we have a larger Asian population. You know, we have some African American, some Hispanic, but for staff, it's um, primarily white. Um, and you don't really see the percentage reflected in the staff data, which is also hard to see um, 
the the difference or the dis discrepancy between the staff and the students. So I think that in a different slide we show the percentage, or maybe in the report mm -hmm. we show the percentage for staff um, uh, by category and race. So there's just a, we see a big discrepancy between the staff and different racial backgrounds and the students in the district. Thank you. So um, just as Ms. Vega just said. Um, we decided that we would break out the diversity by key roles in SBS by percentages so that people would have a better understanding. So for 533 um, FTE of teachers, 91.18% are white. Um, five and a quarter didn't report. Um, Hispanic was three quarters of 1%. And Asian, American Indian, and black were 0.38% each. Um, so we are a largely white district in terms of our teaching um, group. If you move then to our paraprofessionals, of which we have 294, we have a little bit more diversity. Um, this, is, this is where some of our real growth has been. Um, so we're uh, just under 80% um, white. And then our next biggest group is Asian. Again, we have a group of people who don't report, maybe because they don't see themselves reflected in the data. And 3% uh, black. Um, our substitutes, which is where we've really been focusing efforts since 2018, um, we have almost 60% white. So again, with every group you look at where we focused our efforts, you see um, better progress, 17.26% Asian. Um, but the did not report is fully a fifth um, of the individuals. And there's a couple different reasons for that. One is, as we mentioned, um, people may not see themselves reflected in the categories. But the, um, the other reason is that we do have some um, substitutes that have been with us for some time who didn't report, or there are just people who choose not to report. So we will continue to try to ask people to report, but we can't require them to. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to segue that into this next slide, which is really the idea that um, data doesn't always tell the whole story. Um, there are plenty of people who are diverse in some way who aren't represented in the data. Um, we've already covered that first point. Um, Ms. Vega mentioned this, this second point. Um, the self-identity doesn't capture what might be diverse about them for reports. And you know, another thing is that some of these um, categories, which are federal categories, are considered either old-fashioned or even potentially offensive to people. Like someone may prefer um, you know, Asia. Asia is many, many different countries with many different languages and many different cultures. And so someone may not really think of themselves as Asian. They may think of themselves as Japanese or Vietnamese or some other group. Um, and it's the same thing, American Indian. I mean, we went from American Indian to Native American, and now many people prefer ind indigenous peoples. Now, we went ahead and used the information that's in the federal reports. We use those titles. Um, and then finally, there's non-categorized diversity, um, gay, lesbian, bisexual. Um, and we also have uh, faculty whose children are diverse, even if they themselves are not considered so. So we're going to turn it over now to Ms. Satterfield, who is going to share a very heartfelt note from one of her students, just to get across the, the feeling behind um, what we found out through looking at data and through being part of this group. So the overarching idea that I will speak to is the idea that all students do better when they have diverse role models. And we were trying to find different ways to get that across to the committee. So we looked at videos that we had shared um, during our time together. But I came up with a card that I had just got the week before this conversation happened. And the thing that um, I want you to note is the student who wrote me this, is a, this is a senior, one of Rithika's peers, somebody in my honors calculus class. But she didn't start with 
hello, Mrs. Satterfield, or any of that, this is the card that she wrote me. You were the first black teacher I ever had. Until this class, the majority of my teachers were white. But by you just being my teacher, I saw myself represented. Very rarely do we see people of color in positions of success, even more rarely black and African people of color. You were my model for what I could become as an adult, a knowledgeable, compassionate, and wise educator who handles herself with grace. You influenced me to become a person that is patient and understanding. It's a lot about me, but I think the, <laughs> the bigger picture is, is that she started with, that was one of the no most notable things about me is that she could see herself um, in me. Um, although the teaching profession may not be in my future, you demonstrated what it means to truly educate others, and I hope to one day follow you in these steps. As a woman of color, you created a safe and open environment for all types of students to speak about world issues. Although we probably have not changed each other's minds, I feel that we have grown closer and more understanding of each other as people with different experiences and values. These discussions meant so much to me as I was able to practice how to speak calmly and eloquently on what I was passionate about. I was also able to see where people came from and how they formed their own opinions. As a math teacher, the environment you created was welcoming and friendly, encouraging students to work harder. I appreciate how often you greeted us as a family. It showed how much you cared for us. I am so grateful to have had you. Um, and her name is Lena. She's from the class of 2022. Again, I mean, what struck me was that she, the first thing that mattered to her was that she could see herself in someone in that building. So I was very grateful to receive this card. And I think it speaks to the fact that children need to see themselves and they need to see role models that look like them. And it's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's one of the things that we really saw throughout this, there was a lot of data we could present and try to make the point that this is important. But in the amount of time we had for this, um, we really didn't want to get deep into facts and figures. We really thought it was important to have it in the words of one of our own students. You are the first black teacher I ever had. And she was in high school. And that's Graduating. Graduating. <laughs> right. Um, and I think that that just speaks volumes. So as we move on into some of our other overarching ideas, one thing we learned very early on is the advice from the other districts, some who were a little bit further along than us, some who were a lot further along than us, some who weren't quite as far along as us. But one of the things we really learned, you cannot wait for perfection. You cannot have your whole plan nailed out before you get started. There will be criticisms. There will be people who think you're moving too fast. There are people who think you're moving too slowly. But what you have to do is you have to accept that it's imperfect. This is imperfect work. And you have to be able to make some sort of progress so that we can impact our kids now. And so that really led to the questions, what are some things we can do now? What are some, some things we can accomplish say six months, maybe by um, the December holidays, you know, what could we accomplish in the next year? Um, so who's speaking to this? Is it me? Do I keep going? I think I do. I think so. OK, Mark. thank you. Um, so we felt that we really have a lot of work to do as a district. Um, we have amazing models in some other districts. We have tools. We have so many tools and so much information that we all learned collectively. Mm -hmm. There was so much information. We still haven't, as a group, absorbed everything mm -hmm. we learned. And we think there's a lot of work there for the future. Um, but one thing that we did realize is that we do have to stay focused on what this project was about, which was strategic recruitment and retention of professional staff because it was so easy even for us to want to get into every area of how we improve diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging, all of those things. And we felt like if we look at every single thing, some of which are completely out of you know, my lane, um, we'll, we'll get nothing started and we'll get nothing completed. So that was a big thing for us. 
And we really do think there will be no end point to this work. It's going to, going to be continually evolving. Um, and the five-year strategic goal cycles are going to be really helpful for us to refine over time what it is that we can get done. So now I'm turning it over to Ms. Waterhouse. Yes. Uh, so we are very fortunate to have um, a leader in Dr. Sawyer who is as passionate about this work as those of us on this committee. Um, together as a group and with Dr. Sawyer, we set some uh, short-term goals for ourselves. Um, Dr. Sawyer uh, communicated expectations to the hiring facilitators, the leaders in our district. Um, which we enacted earlier this spring at the outset of our hiring season. Notably, he did not want to wait until next year because the bulk of our hiring happens in the spring and then into the summer. Um, so some of the things that we enacted immediately were um, recruiting for diversity. So um, we have asked our hiring facilitators to actively screen applicants looking for applicants that represent diverse uh, groups, diverse experience, backgrounds, and talents, and uh, not getting as hung up on whether those applicants are fully licensed at the moment, but looking for people that have enough uh, of the skills and talents that we need paired with the diversity and look for ways that we can help them through the licensure process as a district. Um, we are assembling hiring teams that are diverse themselves um, and that is not always easy because we don't have a terribly diverse teaching faculty. Uh, but we do have a, a diverse parent group mm -hmm. and we have a diverse paraprofessional group and so we have been able to um, pull together more diverse hiring committees. Um, we have added orientation training for all of our hiring uh, committees which includes doing um, some more little small ways to, to train and orient these groups about uh, in-group bias and doing exercises at the outset of an interview session so that we are on the lookout for ways that we might not be aware that we are exhibiting bias. Um, we have included questions in every interview at this point that include um, and address commitment to and issues of diversity, equity, belonging, and inclusion. Um, so those are the steps that we've already taken and will be taking. Uh, we also set some additional short-term goals that we can be working on for next year. Uh, that includes continuing our group work, though the professional learning community with the Department of Education has come to an end for this year. We've gathered enough information that we can continue to work uh, throughout the next year, and we'd like to actually expand our group and expand our work uh, into the next school year. Uh, we would like to continue to expand the ways that we advertise our positions. Uh, so that includes looking for partnerships with diverse colleges and universities so that we can um, develop uh, partnerships for almost like a pipeline for mm -hmm. teachers graduating, uh, diverse graduates. Uh, continuing to improve the way we word our advertising advertisements for our positions, mm -hmm. um, advertising on diverse websites, and getting involved in community job and career fairs in places where we feel like we could make an impact in terms of diversity. Uh, we will be looking to expand our training for our district leadership team because those are really the people that are doing the, um, the frontline work for hiring. And we also will be working to revise our personnel hiring guide. So this is a guide that we have in district that our uh, district leaders use when um, going through that process of, of hiring. Uh, we'll be looking to develop banks of uh, diversity related questions so that every interview committee isn't asking the same question or the same few questions. Um, revising all of the language within our hiring because we really want to make diversity a focus. We want to embed that concept 
uh, throughout our hiring guide and also creating a bank of activators or exercises that will help our hiring committees uh, to be on the lookout for bias uh, in, in our questioning and in our practices. And I think I'm turning it back over to Barb. Thank you. So um, we've started to brainstorm a little bit about the long-term strategic planning and we hope that some of this can be developed um, with goal setting uh, with the district across for the next five years, strategic goal setting. Um, but they, the teacher diversification project through DESE, they did provide us with a very, very comprehensive self-audit tool. And those of us who have had some time to look at it mm -hmm. uh, recognize that, th that while we have had audits in the past, this particular audit tool, which is a self-reflection, mm -hmm. is going to be incredibly helpful in looking at what works for us and what doesn't work for us in our recruiting, revitalizing, and retention of our staff. So some of the things we've talked about, we've talked about before. Grow your own, paraprofessionals, day-to-day substitutes, Shrewsbury residents. These are diverse groups that will provide us with a rich source um, but we need to help people get from one spot to another spot, spot so they can be teachers, internships, and pre-service training. And we probably had the most conversation about how you recruit. Um, but the last two sessions of the group were focused also on revitalizing and retaining our staff. Um, there were, it's really easy for educators of color to become disenchanted or cynical by what they see about them. I think that's actually true for all educators when there are challenges um, that they can clearly see in front of them. And so um, some of the ideas that were talked about were like rethinking mentorships, um, that you may put a person of color with a person of color so that they have somebody that they can talk to about things that are very particular to them. Um, but that the work of development, which is something I would we would work obviously with Amy Clowder's department. The development is for everybody. You know, it's not just the work of educators of color to develop and help us develop. It's, it's our work to do for ourselves. Um, and then to retain educators, um, our group really spoke quite a bit about mental health is key. You need diverse thoughts and ideas, and if it's the same people sitting in the rooms talking about the same ideas, you're not going to get that, and so it's important to expand out to other people, um, and having that support from others who understand is key. Um, I think I can speak for the whole team, but um, what we learned from listening to our educators of color who sat on our, um, our committee and on our project was incredibly mind-opening. So I don't know if Chris or Mara or Patty or anyone else wants to talk about it, but um, we really appreciated the openness and the sharing that went on. And, you know, um, for me as well, you know, having two children of color, being a member of the gay, lesbian, and bi um, group myself, um, it, it was really, really empowering to be able to talk with other people about what that feels like and how that impacts you at work every single day. So thank you to everybody on the group. I don't know if anybody else had any final comments, but we are open to questions. Yeah, Barbara, I will just say that um, this has really allowed us to take a look at where our goalposts are when it comes to hiring, and uh, Shrewsbury has had the luxury of being able to hire educators who have checked all the boxes along the way as to what the traditional um, mm -hmm. expectations are around becoming like a, a highly uh, regarded teacher. And for us to take a look and, and say, you know, we're not meeting all the check boxes that we need for our students. Um, if we're hiring people who have great educations and come from really traditional settings, uh, if they don't represent our students, if our students are not connecting with them, then we're not doing what we need to do for our students. So uh, working with this group, hearing from some personal experiences, and working with people who have some very like goals in mind for our students, it was eye-opening. And really, uh, it's refreshed kind of my thinking around how we're hiring and, and doing the work for our students. 
And I'd just like to say that I was hired. I was a very untraditional hire. I came in as a, a long-term sub because I owned my own business and I enjoyed teenagers, so I came in to do it. And the first day I did it, I, I knew, I said, I was, I was made to be a teacher, like this is what I need to do. But it was Dr. Dan Gutekinds that ushered me, shepherded me, he, he gave me time. He said, you take your time to get your licensure. They gave me a waiver. They, they actually gave me a tutor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they set me up with another math teacher to get me through the math test. So it was incredible. And they ushered me through every step. So that's a non-traditional hire. So it can't always be check the box. And this person was, you know, you know, we have to think outside the box. Well, I certainly want to thank you, and I want to open it up to my colleagues for their, for their comments, but this is incredibly important work that you're all doing, and thank you. The amount of time and effort you've already put in is very impressive on top of very busy jobs in a very crazy school year. We all appreciate sort of that, that, that level of, of, of attention and effort, but I um, welcome some comments. Ms. Ms. Fritz. I think this is really timely. I know there, was, there are people in the community who think that nothing's happening, that we're not doing anything, and there's so much going on behind the scenes. And just because it's not being talked about at every meeting doesn't mean there isn't something. So this is just very timely, and I'm glad it's coming out. And as I was talking to Dr. Sawyer earlier today, in, the, in my private corporate job, we're doing a lot of DEI work and the hiring, and we're dealing with the same thing. People not reporting, and you know we want to promote, but you can't promote because they need, you know, they haven't reported, and it's just like we're dealing with a lot of these same issues in the private sector as well. Um, and I think it's really important when we talk about diversity. We also don't just look at race and ethnicity. We look at disabled. You know, uh, we have more female than male teachers. You know, I'd love to see more male elementary school teachers and male role models. So there's lots of things that we have to look at when we do this work, and, and it's so multifaceted, and it's going to take a long time. Um, and communication. I think I'm learning in the corporate world, it's that whole communication piece. You know, two-way communication and making sure they're all on the same page, understanding in our hiring practices or what the role is. Um, and the only um, comment I had made to Dr. Soria, and because we had made a mistake in the corporate setting, is when we're talking about the licensure, and Ms. Satterfield, you just explained it perfectly. We want to make sure that we're not offending someone by saying, oh, we'll have to help you, because that's not what this means. And, and in the corporate setting, there was something that really didn't make sense for us as a company, and it made the hiring harder because the, the wording of it. So I think we have to be so careful. We, we definitely want teachers who pass their MTELs, and, but what can we do to get that great person to come in? So I think it's that communication around all of this. So thank you for this work. It's not easy. It's really complicated. It can be um, very tough at times in some of the conversations, I'm sure. So this is great work, and I'm just really glad that it's becoming more public so people will see all of the work that you're all doing behind the scenes. Ms. Boucher, please. I just also wanted to echo uh, what Ms. Heffernan said about the time commitment that you've put, all put into this work um, on top of your, your day jobs. Yeah. Um, the amount of hours I, that you've been doing all these extra meetings and so forth, I just express our appreciation for putting in the time and effort <clears throat> for this very, very important work for our district. And uh, Ms. Satterfield, I wanted to especially thank you for sharing that note um, for all of us to hear. I think it just echoes why this is so important and why you know we, we're so appreciative of, of this work. So thank you very much for sharing that with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Just a few comments and a question. I want to thank everyone for your time and participation in this very important work. Um, I, I think it is important to see this progress being made. Uh, and in particular, I want to single out, I was pleased to see a focus on the uh, orientation for hiring teams. I think one of the things that has always struck out to me about our hiring process in Shrewsbury is that we really do put candidates through a very intense process where they're exposed to a lot of people. And even though ultimately it's, it's one or small group of people making a hiring decision in Shrewsbury's hiring process. There are a lot of folks at the table when we consider bringing somebody on staff. And I, I really want to uh, commend the focus of this work on not just the ultimate hiring authority, but everyone who is involved in the hiring process. I think that that's critical because as we solicit a lot of feedback, input, and opinions when we decide to hire somebody in Shrewsbury, it's important that everybody who's participating in that process understands uh, what our views, values, and goals are when it comes to diversity and hiring. 
question for, for Barb and, and to put you on the spot a little bit. I, uh, I know that obviously some of the work that's being talked about here is in the planning stages. As you talked about, it's ongoing. Of course, you did present to us last fall. We had already put in place um, some changes in practice with talent acquisition. I know this is a particularly busy time of year for hiring, and I know you're kind of the first person to see applicants as they come in. I'm curious if you have a sense of what you're seeing, not asking for obviously for any official figure because hiring for next year is still going on, but I'm curious if, if you're seeing um, any uh, greater diversity in our applicant pool as you look uh, at what you're seeing come in the door for 2022-2023 positions. Thank you for the question. Um, in terms of the applicant pool, um, I think we are seeing diverse candidates. Um, I don't have exact percentages. I know that we have some finalists in the pipeline that we're aware of right now, um, and some that Dr. Sawyer has already appointed. Um, we have a few that are very diverse, particularly joining the high school staff. Um, so we're very pleased about that. Um, and I think when I do come back in the fall, I'll be able to, we'll, we'll be able to look at a retrospective of this hiring season and see how much we were able to move the needle. It's really hard to predict right now, but I do know that we're going to have a more, more diverse group of teachers at the high school and also at the middle level out of Sherwood Middle School for the upcoming school year. And we can see that already. Um, but we'll get more detail as we have it and report out on that in the fall. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank you all for the time and effort that you put into this. Uh, we're no strangers to subcommittees and the amount of hours that it can take. So I really appreciate the time you spent on this important work. And I, I also appreciate the timeliness, as, as Ms. Fritz said. I think you know, we've just spent uh, you know, some time celebrating 18 retirees that uh, have uh, spent anywhere from 19 to 45 years in this district. You talk about retention of uh, mm -hmm. professional staff. Uh, there's an example, and I think uh, some of what could be a contributing factor to the data uh, that we're looking at in this report. And like you said, it's, the data doesn't tell the entire story. And I think you've been uh, you know, very detailed in explaining kind of where we're headed kind of behind the scenes uh, of, of you know, what's coming up next, which is our hiring season during the summer, which is why I really appreciate the report uh, as well. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and there is no end point to this process, as you said. It's ongoing, uh, and it continues to, to, to be uh, such. And, uh, and I think this district's always been forward thinking uh, and uh, you know, never settling for status quo. So thank you very much. And I, I would echo, in addition to the commending, I think that the um, different perspectives that you all have and the different buildings you're in, the different roles you're in, from administrator roles to, um, you know, just across across a lot of our buildings, I'm, I'm sure brought brought different perspectives about that, 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 you, that you have seen. But what I want to just acknowledge that sometimes when we're brought into, you know, statewide training efforts, we may not at the end of the day feel like it was valuable. And what I'm hearing is that this was, in fact, quite a valuable process for us. And so, the, the, you know, appreciating the, the commitment there, but also really glad that the state's providing some leadership that seems to be really helpful and, and providing some things that are really implementable. I, I think about the issues of of in my professional job, I also um, do do a lot of DEI DEI work and in, and facilitation. But recruitment and retention are two very different topics. <laughs> and to we we put them together, they sound alike, but they're just not. Or in the idea that we have a we can recruit somebody in, do they want to stay here? Do we have a culture that makes them want to want to ultimately be one of our retirees? And and how how do we have those those spaces? And so um, even as you try to stay focused on what seems like this is this. You, you say we well, kind of say laser focused. I can appreciate the breadth of what you're trying to tackle um, on on really on all of, all of our behalf. So I'm happy to think about updating to our, our our personnel hiring that guy that's four years old and in this space that's a really long time ago. And our, our thinking as a whole community really has 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 appropriately evolved. And I'm excited to think about your self audit tool and understand what that looks like and hear even more voices sort of sharing what their perspectives have 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 been. Um, and I, I know that I certainly stand ready, and I think we as a committee do, to think about how to embed this work in our strategic planning efforts in the fall. Um, that's like, like a given for me that we think about the, the professional development and the development of our, our educators. You're, you are what we do, right? Without you and all of those who you are representing, right, we, 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 don't, we cannot achieve what we need to. So uh, certainly we stand ready to, to support that. And one, one um, sort of comment, and I, I chatted with Dr. Sawyer earlier today about this. 
I, I love the idea of thinking about how to increase the diversity of our hiring panels by leaning on our parents, and that our parent group clearly, when you look at our students, is is um, um, you know going to be more reflective of the of, of the students, of course, right? Uh, one thought I have as somebody with kids in three different buildings, I see the emails come in of we're looking for a parent. And about three hours later, we're all set. We've got like 17 people who responded, and you know, or something, you know, that which is great. But I also makes me think about who are the parents that are in the position to quickly respond, to see the email, and are they the ones available? And you know, as I, as ideas for you to continue to think about how could we pull back? Because we also know once you're at the moment where you're trying to get somebody, I, I've sat on one of your interview panels. Uh, once you're at the point where you're looking for somebody, right? Your your timing is tight. You're afraid you're going to lose a candidate. All of those things that are going to the complexity here. How can we, as you're early in the hiring process? Open it up to parents. Do those do those sessions to say we're going to be starting hiring. There, there's going to be opportunities. These move kind of quick. How can we get more voices and maybe have a pool rather than a push to the entire building, where you might get you know your your few absolutely wonderful volunteers who you know you can count on, but maybe aren't bringing exactly the perspective you're all aiming for. Mm -hmm. To you know kind of start that a little bit earlier um, as ways to whether you do it at the building level or you know the middle school block or some some way so that we can make sure those parents are the ones who can quickly respond or mm -hmm. or maybe speed isn't the best way to decide that they're there should be on the interview panel too even though speed is of the, of the essence so uh, welcome as you continue to think about this how how we can also help get the message out that this this is a really important and unique role for parents to help us serve uh, going forward so um, Dr. Sawyer, please. This is great work. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I'm, I'm proud of the work that this group has done, and I really appreciate all the time and effort that they've spent. Um, it, it's been uh, really important work, and it's uh, a tribute to, uh, I think, Ms. Malone's leadership uh, in terms of looking to uh, recruit uh, leadership from across all these different roles to, to participate in this. Uh, and that's something that I, I think is, is a real strength and an approach we've used in the past in different ways when we've uh, been going through different change management uh, processes and, and utilizing teacher uh, leadership uh, and, and leadership from other roles within the district and then it's important to continue to do that. Um, th this is important. I, th I think the, uh, the literature is quite clear that organizations that have uh, diversity you know, many different dimensions ultimately are better organizations, whether that's profitability in the corporate sector uh, or just pure effectiveness, uh, regardless of what the mission is. Uh, but I think you also heard tonight why it's so important uh, that we have more uh, of a, a staff that reflects uh, the makeup of our community. Um, Shrewsbury, over the, the 25 years that I've uh, lived and worked here, um, has become a much more diverse community um, that's added uh, some wonderful vibrancy and positives uh, as, as uh, it just has become uh, just a, a different, so many differences that, that, that contribute uh, to what our community is. Um, and since we're an organization that uh, is made up of the fabric of our community with our children and our families, uh, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that uh, we are seeking ways that those who work and provide that education to the students uh, and support families uh, is similarly representative. Um, and again, we can't snap our fingers and make this happen overnight. Uh, and it's something that uh, uh, is important work. Uh, I'm encouraged by some of the things that are happening. I'm very encouraged by the work that this leadership team has done. Uh, and I'm excited what's going to be uh, happening over the next couple of years. Uh, it will not be easy because, of course, there are districts all over the Commonwealth who are trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, people are, it's kind of a, you know, it's a, um, it's a supply demand issue uh, that we're, we're dealing with. So. Uh, we definitely have to look to play the long game to, to an extent, uh, and I, I'm hopeful. Um, I see one of our high school students still with us here today, and I think <laughs> we need to make sure that we're sending messages to our students. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the uh, uh, hires that will bring some diversity to the district uh, that I believe is in the pipeline as a finalist uh, is a graduate of our school district mm -hmm. uh, and didn't and wasn't taking a traditional route, was looking at a different career and, and made a, a shift, to, to an opportunity to substitute much like uh, the experience Ms. Satterfield had. Um, so uh, it, it, things go quickly. Uh, and I think that you know, just, uh, we've received some notes from recent graduates that make me think that we have to be intentional about indicating uh, education is a wonderful career uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we shouldn't discount. Uh, and I think over time, 
uh, as we see some career changers among families. And uh, I think of some of the educators who retired, uh, you heard a couple of the stories. They were career changers. Um, so we have uh, very accomplished, incredibly talented um, families here in Shrewsbury uh, who may be looking to make a career change. And if we can tap into that and benefit from their knowledge, uh, we've had a lot of uh, successful career changers like Ms. Satterfield and others uh, who bring uh, expertise from the private sector or other nonprofit sectors and end up becoming teachers. And that, that's, that's generally really positive for our students. Mm -hmm. Um, and if we can add an element of diversity by doing that, things we've done, we've done that all along the 25 years I've been in Shrewsbury, uh, but with an eye to diversify our staff, um, I, I think there are some uh, exciting opportunities ahead. So thank you very much. We're deeply appreciative of the work you've done uh, and appreciate the support of the school committee as well. Absolutely. Thank you all for being with us thank this you. evening. Thank you. <coughs> then next item on our agenda is in uh, curriculum and this is our uh, an up, a report on our Shrewsbury High School career and trade exploration pathways and early college report and I see Dr. Lazad and some of her team joining us here I know we have staff um, maybe students here to present a report from the Shrewsbury High School career and trade exploration pathways and early college uh, and it, to discuss um, events that they've held, also job shadowing, internship opportunities, uh, and alumni engagement across the district. So, um, Dr. Lazad, I'll turn it over you. to you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us this evening. Um, <laughs> as you know, I'm Jane Lazat. I am the uh, currently the principal of Patton Elementary School and the assistant superintendent for community partnerships and well-being. And I'm joined by five of my colleagues, well, four colleagues and a student, <laughs> uh, with, who, each of whom are going to introduce themselves to you. So I'm going to start with you. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Russell. I'm a school counselor at Shrewsbury High School. Jessica Rice, also a school counselor at Shrewsbury High School. Angie Flynn, the director of school counseling at the high school. Shalini Biju, a junior at Shrewsbury High School. Um, Kathleen Cohan, coordinator of volunteer and um, development, volunteer activities and development. So over the course of the past school year, we have worked in different capacities to expand our career and trade um, exploration programming at Shrewsbury High School, while also aiming to build community partnerships and expand our early college opportunities. Uh, the folks with me tonight are going to talk um, about how that has gone, where each of these um, areas are in its, their infancy stages, I would say, but all are, um, you know, focused on our portrait of a Shrewsbury graduate, as we know that that is foundational to teaching and learning in our schools. Um, and particularly, we are well aware of the fact that the portrait of a Shrewsbury graduate illustrates the importance of innovation and leadership in all of our schools. We know that our students need to be given a sense of autonomy, choice, and responsibility by participating in work and life experiences about which they are passionate. Um, so I'm going to ask Angie and Sean, two of our three coordinators, Kate Mercadante is not with us this evening. Kate has been, Kate is the orchestra and general music teacher, as you know, at Shrewsbury High School. She has worked closely with both Angie um, Flynn and Sean Russell in their roles as coordinators of our career exploration programming this year. So Sean and Angie, take it away. Sure. So back in the winter, Sean, Kate and I, and Kathleen, um, we met pretty regularly um, to try and set up some job shadowing and internships. So we worked with different um, businesses in the community with Kathleen's help. She was good to get us some contacts. Um, <laughs> And it was, to be honest, a little slow going in the winter. You know, the pandemic was, COVID was still sort of rising and, and there. But we were able to secure um, seven job sites for April Vacation Week. Um, we sent about 40 students to those seven places for job shadowing. Um, we had the Woo Sox. We had Stepping Stones. It's a child care center. Nyla Labs. Um, the Charles River Veterinary Lab. Shrewsbury Federal Credit Union and the Town of Shrewsbury Building Commissioner. So it was very successful. We got student feedback. Shalini is going to talk about her experience in, in a bit. Um, and we also, I got a little bit of feedback from those businesses as well. Um, many of them want us 
will partner with us again. Um, the Wu Sox, um, Alex Richardson, he was great. He's like, oh, we loved you. We'll have you back. Um, so they were all very excited. And today, Sean and another counselor brought some students over to the Fire Academy in Stowe. So I'll let him talk about that. Yeah, um, so it was really cool. Um, Dr. Sarah Walsh, she reached out to Tava Zidlo maybe last month that they were interested in partnering with us for a um, really like a, a training day where we brought seven juniors um, where they, they put the gear on, they went through a lot of tasks such as, you know, how to pr properly search um, a burning building, how to utilize a hose where the students they brought that up and down the stairs. Um, and also they were able to watch the active recruits in the uh, Masters Fire Academy right now um, do some work with fire, how to properly, you know, put one out using the fire extinguisher, water and the hose. Um, overall, great experience. Um, the instructor that they had, his name's Mike Jelinas. He's a firefighter from Fitchburg. He was absolutely wonderful with the kids. Um, this was actually the first time that the Fire Academy decided to do this. So we were the pilot program. And I recently learned that they're gonna be talking um, with the governor about expanding this based off the success that we had today. Um, and student feedback just from the ride, the ride home, they were, hey, can we do this again as seniors? <laughs> they can't wait. It was, uh, it was an amazing day. So the other council was Frank Flynn at the time meeting or the, the day. So. Do you, you want to talk about? Okay, so Shalini also did um, a Worcester State Early College program with us as well. So I'll have her first talk about your um, job shadow experience. Okay. Um, can so I just over ask that we grab the microphone so we can make sure that people are list that one over there. Can you pull that over, Shalini? Thank you so much. <laughs> so you're fine. You're fine. It's the Hello. extra ones for the people <laughs> listening. Yes, go for it. You're perfect. Okay. Um, so over April vacation, I participated in the job shadowing opportunity provided by SHS. And I chose to shadow at Nyla Lab since the company aligned with my personal interest the most. Um, so we got to put on lab equipment and actually see like how the machines work and how the entire lab operated. Um, Mr. Nyer also did a lecture on the science behind COVID testing, which I found to be really interesting and really educational and definitely like inspired that as a career choice for me. Um, and I would definitely participate in another shadowing opportunity if offered by SHS. So we would formally like to thank the Wu Sox, Stepping Stones, Nyla Laboratory, Charles River Laboratory, Shrewsbury Federal Credit Union, and the Town of Shrewsbury Building Commissioner um, for inviting, welcoming, and encouraging our students uh, during April Vacation Week as they participate in job shadowing experiences. I'm going to ask Jessica Rice to take the next topic or sure. the next event sure. and, uh, that will be continuing. So we um, hosted a, um, a fair where we um, reached out to um, everything from um, programs for trade, um, also any school to work, um, um, places that are interested in having high school students and train them. Um, we had a Shrewsbury firefighter there. Uh, we worked closely with um, Kathleen to reach out to alum alumni who would want to come, um, all in an effort to really reach out to our community. And we um, announced it at Shrewsbury High School, both in school and with the parents and at Oak, um, knowing that this is a topic that um, at all of those um, grade levels, it's being talked about at home and in school and thought about in terms of what are my options after school, after high school. Um, I started thinking about this in terms of my own sort of professional development, you know, prior to the pandemic. I have conversations that's part of my, my daily job is talking about, you know, what are you, what are you thinking about? You know, what, what path do you think you see yourself going down? Um, and we've had small pockets of exposure for students here and there, um, few trips to Porter and Chester, for example. Um, we have some special ed teachers who might, um, you know, bring a speaker into their classes, but we really needed to, to focus on having a larger program where we are educating our school community at large um, about all of the options other than four-year institutions it's just not for everybody and that's okay and so um, we're we're finding um, we had a lot of great um, feedback for the event both there and afterwards I um, I received a card in the mail um, 
I was like, I brought, also brought a card um, <laughs> um, from a gentleman who I, I don't even know, but he cut our, we had an article in the Community Advocate. They came out and did a piece, which was really great, and he wanted to just thank us, um, addressed it to me, but thank us all for putting on the event, um, thinking that this is something that we need to, um, you know, allow for our kids to learn more about. So um, we were really excited to start there, and we're hoping that next year we continue with our ideas and, you know, as we get, you know, going with being open and <laughs> having more access, um, see where it takes us. So. We really appreciated the feedback. Um, we had some feedback both from um, students and those who were there sharing their work with our students regarding ways in which we can strengthen um, the event and the programming in the future. And lots of thanks um, went out to those who facilitated and coordinated the event um, who are here tonight. So um, we're going to move. Is it this a good time to move into early college? I think so, Angie? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, we're going to share some an early college update. Mm -hmm. So Shrewsbury Public Schools partnered with Worcester State University back in the fall. Um, they had a grant through the Department of Higher Ed, um, and they received money through the Commonwealth Dual Enrollment Program. So they wanted to partner with us to offer some courses for our students that would be, not only would they earn three free credits from Worcester State, but also those credits could be on the Shrewsbury High School transcript as well. Um, so I worked with Dr. Ryan Forsyth um, over there, and we offered a class, um, or they, I should say they offered a course, um, Intro to Business. It was during the spring semester. We had 19 students. Shalini was one of them. Um, the course was in person at Worcester State University, which I thought was very valuable for students to get on the campus and really be in the classroom at a college campus. Um, and so it, was, it went really well, very successful. It took place on Saturday mornings. And then we also are now partnering for a summer course. Um, and so we have about 15 students who are interested in the, our summer course, which will be personal finance, and that'll take place. It's a little different because it's summertime, but it's twice a week um, in the mornings. And I'm working um, to continue this project in the fall. We're going to offer more courses, um, and it's a great way for students to get some credits, um, get some early college exposure, and um, yeah, just get, get some good experience. Well, Shalini, you talk about her experience with Intro to Business. Um, so as Ms. Flynn said, I took the Intro to Business course, um, and I actually really liked it a lot more than I was expecting to. Um, the idea of like early college seemed a little daunting to me, but I really loved the professor, and I learned a lot of skills that will definitely be useful to me in my future. Um, before the class, I wasn't really like super interested in business. It was just something that I kind of wanted to try out. But I think a lot of the skills that I learned will be applicable to any field that I choose to go to. I also really liked the pacing of the course um, because I was worried that it was going to go too fast compared to a high school course. But I thought it was w really well done. And um, I will be taking the summer course as well. So I'm very pleased. It was a, a really good experience for all. And none of this could happen without the support of Kathleen Cohen and formerly <laughs> Michelle Biscotti, um, who really worked tirelessly to help us make um, connections with partners in the community, share ideas and suggestions, help with the lead the Colonial Fund effort. So I'm going to ask Kathleen to share how this all comes together um, as we think about alumni development, community connections, and student programming. Yeah, uh, thanks. I don't know if you know, but over the last two and a half years, we've been searching for alumni. <laughs> and we have about 400 right now. But um, some of you who have parents, uh, if you're Sandy, you probably saw some of this yep. come to your house. <laughs> um, Jason, hopefully you saw this. If you didn't, I'll hand out one out to you. <laughs> we, we put together these postcards and mailed them out to, to thousands of alumni um, and asked people to reconnect with us because we found more and more that there were places where we could we could have our alumni back. and. As we saw tonight with the phenomenal uh, students that were here, these students leave and they go on and they, they have phenomenal careers and they have great experiences. And we've been finding that by inviting them to come back and share those experiences that they're really enriching um, the, the students that we have now. And, and I, they just offer a very unique perspective. Like for um, the career fair, we had alumni that came back and some of them 
had um, chosen to go on to college, but it wasn't the right experience for them, so then they went on and, and became electricians in, instead. Um, we had others who went right away to be an electrician, people that went on to, um, to take some classes at Quinn Sig for a couple of years, et cetera. Um, we had a broad variety of, of um, experiences after high school and really wanted to be able to show the kids when they came into this career and trade fair that there's more than just a four-year college um, option available after, after high school. So um, I have just had like the best time in uh, meeting alumni and we have now an Instagram account. We have, a, um, a, I'm posting things on the Shrewsbury High School alumni mm -hmm. Facebook page. We have um, a LinkedIn group. Um, and uh, we've been finding a variety of different people um, through that way as well. So um, the way that we've used our alumni, and that sounds terrible, but the way that we've had our, <laughs> invited our alumni to come back was um, initially a couple years ago, they came back to present as our students, our legacy. Um, it was the opening day for uh, the first day of school. Um, during the pandemic, uh, they were uh, just a lifesaver, I think, for kids and for our teachers as well to be able to have Zoom chats when we weren't really doing very much um, in, with the, the school programming at that time. And um, Michelle and I were both, in, and Jane was in on the calls um, with the Zoom chats, and it was just really fascinating to listen to the, the experiences of the alumni. And the kid, just to give you some background, the kids had said ahead of time what type of subjects that they wanted to, to, to learn about, and so we found alumni that fit them. And so um, the alumni just got on and they were really engaged with the kids and asked questions and, and typically it was about an hour conversation. Um, after that, we thought that it would be great to have the kids, um, the alumni come back into different classrooms. And so uh, we once again paired up um, the teachers' um, requests for certain subjects with alumni um, that had that experience. And this year, um, so each time we have about 30 different alumni that are engaging. So. Um, multiply that by three different times, and so we've now had about 75 to 100 different alumni um, come back to school. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's barely been a, a very good experience on, on both sides. Um, and I encourage you to look at our alumni site that's off of the main Shrewsbury Public Schools page. There's a link at the bottom. Um, and that has a whole bunch of pictures, um, content about what we've been able to do, the list of names of, of the alumni that have connected with us. Um, oh, and I wanted to mention too um, our telethon that we did um, to raise money for the for the theater and arts department was phenomenal because we were able to interview um, former students. They came back. They were just really excited. John's nodding his head. Yeah, it was a really really great experience um, to be able to meet these people. And so, um, you know, we graduate phenomenal students. So why not in invite them to come back? For the future, um, what we'd like to be able to do is, is to create a platform. Um, we're looking into some software right now and creating a platform where alumni can connect. And this has become something that um, many businesses as well as schools have found as an invaluable way of keeping in touch with people that have left their company or their schools. Um, and it's a place where alumni can connect with each other, um, such as like a, a virtual reunion, or we can find um, access to the, the alumni for the teachers. Teachers can log in, students can log in, juniors and seniors looking for career advice, mentoring, um, job shadowing. Um, alumni can look for, for students that may want to be able to apply for a job. Just a really great way for our alumni to connect. So. Um, we're hoping to be able to do that next year and be able to engage more alumni and really um, grow our database right now, which is really only about 400 people to hopefully 1,000 or more. Thank you. <laughs> so this is our opportunity to invite those in the community who are in the trades, who are, um, are part of the business world, nonprofit. If you are interested in hosting a student or two or three to job shadow, participate in an internship, um, if you need workers for pay, we have students seeking all of these opportunities. So please reach out to any one of us sitting here at the table. Um, and thank you for listening, and we're ready for questions if you have them. Excellent. Well, th thank you all very much for being with us. I welcome comments and questions. Ms. Boucher, please. Thank you all for your presentation. I thought it was excellent. It's very exciting to hear about all these different opportunities that are going on, and um, I think meeting different needs of different types of students in the, in the Shrewsbury um, school community. I think in light of um, ACEBET and what's going on with losing the seats there, I think it would be really um, helpful if for next year if you could track 
data as to um, who's attending these different programming um, opportunities for us um, so we can kind of see who's taking advantage of these different um, opportunities um, because I think it'll be, you know, we're going to be looking for ways for yeah. different students to, you know, make different types of connections and um, maybe with the trades, with, you know, different college programming, um, maybe outside of, you know, um, the traditional kind of yeah. um, school, you know, more vocational type stuff. So I think it would be really helpful to kind of have some data mm -hmm. um, for next year as you're looking um, to, you know, kind of continue this programming. But thank you all for this presentation tonight. It was really helpful and exciting to hear what's going on. Yeah, we need to recreate thank it. you, and I just want to piggyback on Ms. Boucher's comments. I think um, the job shadowing is huge, and hands-on is the biggest for students who maybe I want to go to college, maybe I want to study X in college, and now I tried it and I don't like it, or um, I want to trade. And at town meeting this year, the most comments, and Ms. Heffernan handled it excellently, <laughs> it was all about the lack of um, openings at ACIBIT and hands-on mm -hmm. trade. You know, I think we do a very good job of college and preparing for college, but I think um, now that we don't have that outlet for our students, I would like to see more effort in that area. Um, uh, the fire academy that Ms. Russell went mm -hmm. to, that's hands-on. Mm -hmm. Students are gonna, <clears throat> maybe I love it or I don't. Um, I had passed on some information after April school vacation on the New England um, Trade Laborers Union out of Hopkinton. They do a four-day, um, they pay the students, it's like plumbing, electrical, hands-on. And I think those are the things that we really need to really focus on where we don't have an outlet for our mm -hmm. students anymore. And it's a population that is going to be underserved because we have our Sh Shrewsbury community, mm -hmm. but we don't have everything we need within our community. So I think we have to start looking outside mm -hmm. and, you know, and for those. <clears throat> but this is great. Um, you, you're on the right track. One question I had, um, I know we've got the partnership with Worcester State. There's so many colleges in this area. I was just watching something about Worcester and they were talking about like one of the highest percentages of colleges in the country in a certain geographic area. Aren't there more colleges that we could partner with? I know Holy Cross used to do some things for students to get more students into classes for credit or to decide, do I really want to spend 75,000 a year and be a X major? Um, yeah. Just mm -hmm. looking for more opportunities mm -hmm. from We've got so many colleges. We can certainly look into that. Um, I know this one with Worcester State was through a grant so that the students could take the course for free. Mm -hmm. um, so that is something we can look into other colleges mm -hmm. and see mm -hmm. if that's worth. I know a lot of students do take classes through Quinn Sig right. um, at their own cost. They pay mm -hmm. for them, but it is a good experience and they get that sort of mm -hmm. exposure to college. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, and it's kind of outside the box, if there's any talk about, you know, we have the traditional high school schedule. Is there any talk about having mm -hmm. some on campus, some off going to Quinsig or going to a trade, taking a trade class that we're not on our campus the whole time? Is that something we're going to start looking into or is, I don't know how that would all work. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So we have talked with Mr. Bazzillo who's here um, and we're looking at schedule changes. It's a whole, lots of things in the works. Right, so, okay, yes. perfect. Excellent, thank you. thank you. And just quickly, maybe uh, just to remind people that there are, uh, in the program of studies for Shrewsbury High School, there is a work uh, study option where mm -hmm. students can actually leave the campus and get credit for mm -hmm. working a job um, as well. And uh, mm -hmm. we have a, a number of students who have taken mm -hmm. advantage of that yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. and I think that's part of the data that you were talking about, yeah. knowing about how many students do it, where, mm -hmm. how, all of that. Yeah. And we have a, a, senior pro a senior year program where students mm -hmm. can attend Quinsig. Um, and get both their first year at Quinsig <coughs> and their senior year mm -hmm. um, completed. Um, I just signed up two of my mm -hmm. rising seniors today. So that is something where yeah. students, if they want to mm -hmm. get an early start looking and, and experiencing it. Thank you. We've had some success, yeah. Thank you. Jason. Just a comment to echo my colleagues, the importance of all of this in the context of ACIBET, but also mm -hmm. I just want to um, call out that these three topics we've talked about tonight, alumni engagement, access to early college, access to exploring careers, um, have all been sort of on and off our agenda for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm just really, really pleased to see this work really starting to bear fruit. And also mm -hmm. that they, all three of these topics are being coordinated together because they're all very clearly interrelated. So mm -hmm. I'm just really pleased to, to see that uh, this work is not only happening, but they, each of those pieces is happening in the context of one another. 
Thank you. Yeah, just to piggyback off everybody, I know what's been said already about vocational challenges we all know about. I know it was the number one question at town meeting, mm -hmm. uh, and I see this as an opportunity. Uh, it's this a key initiative to expose uh, students to uh, not only career pathing, but also like early college. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, very strong advocate for job shadowing. I just think about my own career path. I'm definitely not doing what I was ex you know, expecting to do when I went through college. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just think it's, it's huge value to just immerse students in a day-to-day -day job, even for some time with a uh, fire department or uh, you know, a laboratory, just because maybe it's something you think you're interested in now, but when you set foot in that environment, maybe it, you didn't really expect it to be uh, you know, in a certain way. Um, and I also think the, the engagement with the alumni is phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, and I did watch the SSMA telethon, and I thought, uh, actually, one of the guests, I think it was Catherine Brunel, she was class in 94, and she's achieved major success on Broadway. I just think about the aspiring performing artists that were watching that and very inspired by that. So I just think the more we can engage with alumni, with area businesses and area colleges, I think it's uh, definitely helpful. So thank you for the presentation. I think I would certainly add the, the thanks. I want to just call out that the um, community participants, both for the job fair and for the for April vacation, certainly thank all of our partners in the community for, for making themselves available. We hope they see value in it. I want to just acknowledge, Kathleen, the work that you do that is behind the scenes of I can't even imagine the number of phone calls to make all to make a lot of these things happen and can continue to build those those connections and and I think it's important for the community to know uh, Dr. Lazad, who doesn't like a lot of attention, but is doing this work in addition to running one of our schools. Uh, and that is that, that you know while we are eager to have you be able to focus on this full time, that there is an awful lot of progress as well. And and as as Jason mentioned, the coordination of all these different pieces and how they all kind of fit together to weave a, a web of different opportunities for young people. So I want to just really thank you for being able to start a lot of very important work uh, and, and, and spend the last couple of years really also pitch hitting in a very important building uh, as, as, as well. Um, a couple of months ago, I received two letters from students, and I think it's thanks to our 11th grade civics program suggesting things that we should be doing as a, as a, as a district. And one was around financial literacy, uh, and one was around more life skills. And then I think about what these programs are, whether it's more that specific financial literacy class and a personal finance or um, really connecting and uh, between work you know the, the work work life and life skills for you know what we know employers are saying kids need that uh, and and the young people are telling us that they need that uh, and which which is just great so i'm really happy to hear about the capacity building work that we're beginning whether it's platforms mm -hmm. that's a lot of social media accounts you're monitoring now uh, to, to, to stay on top of but all of that is important to build to build a really strong foundation so i uh, just want to really uh, call out all, all, an incredible amount of great work that's happening. Uh, Jelini, I thank you for staying with us th throughout this evening and sharing your personal experiences. Those are really important for us to get a sense about how are, how are the young people experiencing it and is it, is it sort of working from where they stand. So uh, thank you all very much. And Dr. Sawyer. Thank you. Uh, I particularly appreciate it hearing Jelini, so thank you. <laughs> Glad you're participating in all these opportunities. And I think over time we'll hear more student voices as we get deeper into this. I'm, I'm pleased and appreciate you mentioned that, Ms. Heffernan, that Dr. Luzat, uh, although uh, has very graciously served as the acting principal at Patton for two years now, uh, has moved some of the goals forward, um, and especially as things started to loosen up a little bit this year uh, with at the pandemic, uh, moving more towards our, our strategic goals uh, under the category of connected learning for a complex world, as Mr. Palich mentioned. Um, these were things that uh, we have been uh, looking to do for a number of years now. Uh, literally states build community partnerships with businesses, institutions, individuals to increase access to experiential learning and career awareness, um, and, and particularly in the, in the uh, science, technology, uh, engineering, mathematics, and the arts. Um, and uh, it's really, this is uh, a great start. Uh, we have more work to do. Uh, I really appreciate the work that these uh, uh, educators have done. Uh, through the counseling department uh, to try to find ways for, for kids to find their pathway uh, and to, to see opportunities. Uh, that's something that can be uh, very influential, whether it's something they fall in love with or something they realize maybe it isn't what I'm interested in. Um, these, these are uh, wonderful things. And, and I think one of the real challenges is our, our, our kids' schedules are packed. They're doing a lot of different things. Uh, but uh, you know, we've talked a lot as we're coming out of the pandemic, finding ways to connect kids uh, through 
to their school and through their school to experiences um, is important. So I'm, I'm excited about the work ahead. Uh, and I particularly want to thank um, Ms. Cohane for uh, the work that she's done. Uh, I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank Michelle Biscotti, who served, uh, uh, they uh, shared this role for a number of years. Uh, Michelle uh, moved on to become the, uh, I believe her title is Assistant Director of Development for Mass Bay Community College. Uh, we groomed her well for that role, and uh, I know she'll do great work there. Uh, but as a, as a duo, they did incredible work. We're, we're happy that Ms. Cohen is continuing with us, uh, but making those connections with alumni. I remember there was a question early in my superintendency about how can we start to develop, why, why, you know, developing alumni relations like colleges and some private schools do, um, and, uh, you know, but, which is a wonderful thing and an idea to do, and we've made a lot of progress with it. Uh, but, you know, I remember part of my answer was that though they have departments that are well-funded and well-staffed to do that work, um, it just doesn't happen. Um, and so the, the work uh, that, that we have, have started and that's going to, and utilizing technology to be able to find ways uh, to do more of that. But with Dr. Lazar coming back into the role full-time uh, uh, and uh, with the uh, counseling staff, Ms. Mercadante, who couldn't be here this evening, uh, uh, as well as Ms. Flynn, Ms. Rice, Mr. Russell, um, and their colleagues, uh, and with the support of Ms. Cohen, I'm very confident we're going to uh, move forward in a very productive way with an eye on all kinds of students, but particularly those who may have otherwise opted for vocational mm -hmm. technical education uh, who are going to be entering ninth graders next year. Mm -hmm. um, so again, thank you, and we, uh, this has really been some terrific work. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Um, okay, the next item on our agenda is in the policy frame, and it is our local wellness policy revision. This will be our second look, and we're hoping to take a vote this evening. Our first reading of the updated local wellness policy uh, was shared on May 25th with the school committee, um, and uh, we had um, uh, Noelle Freeman and Dr. Erica Pratt with us to share the policy at that time. Uh, and it is an update to reflect the district's current wellness practices and um, to include those relative to social emotional health, um, aspects of health, excuse me, and was informed by feedback from many stakeholders. The draft has been revised slightly based on feedback from the committee and we did get an updated uh, version this afternoon. So let me uh, pause and Dr. Shore, is there anything else that you'd like to say on this topic or we can take comments from the committee members if they have any further ones? Uh, other than that, I recommend uh, you approve. All right. Any other comments from the, the members at this point in time? The question as they usually mm -hmm. is with the policy, was there any public feedback received? I didn't see anything. I have not. come to our all no. school committee. No. I, have not, I, have not, I have not received any to the entire school committee, nor any to, that came to my account. Um, I do want to note that um, this document, that one of the changes that was made was a suggestion from, last, or from our last meeting um, to include uh, an acknowledgement around translation and for languages of, of students, but I also just really appreciate that this document, um, in addition to doing an important piece of work of aligning us with our state regulations and, and federal regulations, acknowledges some of the important work we've done around cultures in our schools, both on surveying of students, which um, we know is, a, is an important tool for us, and, and family engagement to really document why that's important. So I, uh, I, I certainly do appreciate that. If no one else has any other comments, uh, thinking that this document really does support our district's attempt to acknowledge that wellness does matter across a whole variety of, uh, of spectrums, I would uh, welcome a motion that the committee approve the updated policy. It's policy number 649, our local wellness policy. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. And all those if in favor, please do so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? We'll pass that unanimously. Thank you very much. And our next item of uh, new business is the uh, superintendent's contract and um, uh, looking also for a vote this evening. As a, a, way, a way of background, we have um, a vote certainly is required for the school committee to authorize the chair to approve an updated employment uh, agreement with the superintendent of schools, the, the most comfortable of, of agenda items I know for you, Dr. Sawyer. So uh, <laughs> this contract is serving to do two things. It is both a performance and a market adjustment. I wanted to speak for, to each one of those separately. Um, on the matter of performance, at an earlier meeting, we provided a comprehensive evaluation of Dr. Sawyer's performance. Um, that was after uh, in, input from all, all of us, but also input from our community, the staff, and, um, and parents and, and, and community members. And on, 
uh, nearly all accounts, we had sort of stellar reviews for you, Dr. Sawyer, um, especially noting the challenging time that we are in today in education and that, frankly, we are going to be in for, for certainly some period of time. We have an incredibly well-run school district, uh, and uh, Dr. Sawyer, I would be the uh, first to thank you for your efforts and your leadership in making sure that that, that that is the case and continues to be. So I'm grateful for your ongoing work in our, in our community writ large. Um, the second piece, in addition to performance, is, is a matter of the market. Uh, and last year, uh, the school committee and superintendent agreed that we would um, undertake a, a labor market study of compensation for the role of superintendent during, the, um, during this current fiscal year in order to determine if further compensation adjustments may be in order. And a uh, review of compensation in comparable school districts showed that the market for superintendent compensation has evolved significantly. Um, and with superintendents with less ex significantly less experience, I would say, earning substantially more than our superintendent's current compensation. In particular, I would note that um, uh, we have been fortunate to have Dr. Sawyer leading our district for the past 13 and we hope 14 years. Um, uh, similarly, when we um, when we look at excuse me, when we look at other similarly situated um, districts, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and both in terms of um, excuse me, two two important comparable groups. I want to I want to point out. We, we consistently look in, on both educator performance and student performance at either our ClearGov comparable districts or our DART districts. I cannot remember what that acronym stands for, but based on either um, communities with socioeconomics that are similar or student profiles that are similar. And in both of those, um, um, we, uh, we're under market uh, based, on, based on the value that we, that is certainly I, and I think speaking for this, this, this committee, see in the value that you, that you bring to our, our district, Dr. Sawyer. <coughs> uh, we are, there's only one, one community in all of those districts that has had a longer serving superintendent, and I think it was testament tonight from the retirees to the students that our administrative team is incredibly strong, uh, and that really ties, ties back to the work that you do. When we look at the market in particular, we have many newer superintendents, some making with less than three years experience who are making more. Um, therefore, with all of that in mind, um, the recommendation, recommended compensation to, ad to adjust uh, for, for this, and we hope to remedy this, uh, is really in three parts. First, um, a $15,000 salary and market performance adjustment um, for the current fiscal year to be paid prior to June 30th, um, 2022. A, secondly, a 10,000 salary and market performance adjustment for the period of the next fiscal year or, or school year, July 1st, 2022 through um, and, and then con continuing. Um, and then third, to provide a three-year um, cost of living increase for fiscal year 2023. I would note that the uh, intention here as well is to execute this all through a five-year employment contract between the superintendent and the school committee um, that would be beginning on July 1st of this year and running us through June 30th of 2027. Um, before we move towards a vote, I would sort of welcome any comments um, by, by my colleagues. Please. I support this recommendation, um, and I think for me, when I look at it, anytime we look at salaries or union contracts, we always look at labor market. I mean, that's the hallmark of what we should be doing, making sure that we're paying people fairly within their um, job. But we also want to look at um, institutional knowledge, leadership, work ethic. A lot of other things go into this. But I see the investment in Dr. Sawyer's investment in our community, in our school district, that pays dividends way beyond what any salary increase would be. Um, so I'm highly supportive of this. Thank you. Please, Mr. Chairman. I would echo Mrs. Fritz's comments. I am in strong support of this as well. Uh, obviously, we recently completed a thorough evaluation process of the superintendent as we do every year. That evaluation certainly supports uh, the, the basis that this committee feels that we have a very uh, strongly performing superintendent. Um, I want to note that something that Obviously, Shrewsbury has a, a very high-performing, well-regarded school district, and something that seems uh, endemic to districts that don't perform as well, that don't enjoy a reputation, is instability and leadership. Mm -hmm. um, it is very much in this district's interest to retain uh, Dr. Sawyer. Obviously, Dr. Sawyer is very invested in this community, but uh, uh, regardless, it is incumbent upon this committee to make sure we are compensating this position fairly enough, not only to uh, retain Dr. Sawyer, but but also, you know, God forbid, sometime in the future, 
um, if we had to fill this role, we would need to be um, very, very competitive. This is, mm -hmm. this is not a job that a lot of people can do. Um, and to be blunt, this is not a job that a lot of people who weren't already doing it decided that they wanted to do in the last mm -hmm. two years. Mm -hmm. uh, so for those reasons and, and more, I, I am in support of this. Yeah, I'm also very supportive of this. I, I think the institutional knowledge is invaluable to the district. 13 years, uh, like you said, there's not many others that have spent that long in a district. Um, also think about over the many years that we've weathered many different financial crises, uh, and uh, Dr. Sawyer has foregone uh, cost of living increases uh, in those years. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the body of work speaks for itself from my perspective. Uh, you know, we're in this position of success, especially over the last two and a half years because of his leadership. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, I feel confident uh, that this is uh, adding tremendous value to the school district. And, uh, you know, he's not only a leader of this district, but he's also uh, a resident and a, and a parent in the district. And I think that's uh, extremely valuable. So. Thank you. Dr. Sawyer, before we move to vote, is there anything you'd like to add here? Uh, I'm very grateful for the support uh, of the committee. Uh, I am uh, very committed to Shrewsbury, uh, and it uh, is very gratifying that the committee uh, worked together with me to be sure that uh, my compensation was uh, aligned with what uh, the level of experience and, uh, and of course, I'm appreciative for the, the performance review and the feedback we re I've received from the community. Um, it's a team effort, of course, uh, and, and my success is, is reflective of the success of the leadership team and the educators and support staff and everyone who's part of the school district. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly uh, I appreciate uh, the effort to uh, uh, be responsive to uh, where the position is in the market, um, as well as a reflection of, of my uh, time in Shrewsbury and, and uh, uh, the, your perception of my performance. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. At this point, if folks can bear with me for a somewhat longer motion, um, I'd be willing to take a, uh, take the motion that the committee vote to authorize um, myself as chair to execute an updated employment agreement between the school committee and Dr. Joseph M. Sawyer as superintendent of schools to provide a salary market performance adjustment of $15,000 for the current fiscal year to be paid prior to June 30th, 2022, and to execute a new employment contract for the superintendent schools for the period of July 1st, uh, 2022 through June 30th, 2027, to include a market and performance adjustment to the superintendent's salary of $10,000 and a 3% cost of living increase effective July 1st, 2022 for fiscal year 2023, uh, a salary of $238,112, with all other contract terms remaining unchanged. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you very much. Moved and seconded. All those in favor can do so by saying aye. 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 Uh, Dr. Sawyer passes unanimously. We are pleased and very happy to have you with us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, next item for business, we have a, approval of minutes. The minutes from the school committee meeting held on May 25th, 2022 uh, were provided under separate cover. If folks had a chance to review those and any modifications or changes, not seeing any, those will be marked as approved as drafted. We do need to go into an executive session tonight, so I'm gonna ask for a motion to adjourn to executive session for the purposes of addressing Mass General Law 30A, uh, Purpose 7, to comply with or act under the authority of any general special law or federal grade and ant requirement for the purpose of reviewing, approving, or releasing executive session minutes. Um, also for the purpose of addressing Mass General Law 30A, Purpose 3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of a public body, and the chair so declares, uh, in terms of uh, related to, excuse me, Shrewsbury Educational Association Units A and or B, the Shrewsbury Paraprofessional Association and or the Cafeteria Workers Association. And uh, third, for the purposes of addressing Mass General Law 30A to conduct strategy ses set sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Purpose two, where deliberation in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of a public body. And to return to open session only for the purpose of adjourning for the evening. May I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Thank you. And... Um, uh, this does require a roll call vote, so I will, Ms. Boucher. Aye. And uh, Ms. Fritz. Aye. And Mr. Pallich. Aye. Mr. Wensky. Aye. And myself, aye. Uh, we are adjourned for the evening. Thank you and good night.